Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-Centered Encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose Success of bringing about global African wisdom lifetime. and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com. Struggle and achievement. And what I mean by success, I think I'm talking about the quality of your life. Not how much money you accumulate, not how many degrees you earn, not how many awards you receive, not how much you're seen on television, or whether you become the President of the United States. It is the quality of your life that's important. As a young person, trying to determine what I was going to do with my life, I somehow always felt that life had a purpose and that each life had a purpose. And as a teenager, I started seeking for my purpose in life. I believe that if one sought and found the purpose for one's life, that one could be fulfilled, one could be happy and one would make a contribution to better the lives of others. And as I continued through high school and into college, and on after college, it was in Boston that I met Martin Luther King, Jr., I thought I had found a purpose for my life, but I knew it always would be that I had to give something back because I grew up in a segregated society, totally segregated. And my education was separate but never equal until after I went to college. So I knew I had to work much harder than most people in order to achieve my goals because I believe you have to be the best that you can possibly be get the best education and training and exposure that you can possibly have, and at the same time find that purpose and follow it. After I was married and we had gone to Montgomery and we found ourselves in the forefront of a movement And after our house was bombed, my first child was when she was about two and a half months old. And both sets of parents, mine and Martin, were pulling on us to come to where it was safer, either at my home in Marion, Alabama, for me and my baby, or to Atlanta, where Martin's parents were. And of course, we chose to stay in Montgomery because we felt that we were part of a worldwide struggle that was that was connected any oppression anywhere in the world we were somehow connected to it i had that sense back in 1955 56 a few days after the bombing, and I had to do a lot of soul searching. And I remember feeling that 
Now I know why Martin chose Montgomery. Now I know why we came back south to the cradle of the Confederacy. We are supposed to be here. It's a great feeling of satisfaction you get when you sense that you are in the right place at the right time and that we were chosen. I felt chosen as well. And I look back on the path that I had taken to Antioch College from high school in Marion, Alabama, then to Boston, New England Conservatory of Music. And all the time I realized I had been preparing for the leadership role and the co-worker, partner, wife, mother, civil rights, human rights activists that I was becoming, was and was becoming. And it was a tremendous feeling of satisfaction. And I said, what a privilege. What a privilege it is to be a part of a struggle that's bigger than we are, that we don't know where it's going, but we know that it's moving toward bringing about greater justice, equality, peace, freedom, for all people. Context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday, March 31st, 2017. So I have been told uh, that was the late Coretta Scott King. Uh, that was from a 1997 speech that she gave in Freddie Gray's Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, this is our debut study session on her autobiography, My Life, My Love, My Legacy. Uh, came out just this year, just a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, she contributed, even though she passed away in 2006, uh, she contributed uh, to the project. Uh, it was also co-authored by the Reverend Dr. Barbara Reynolds, uh, claimed black journalist, uh, really looking forward uh, to reading and just learning more information. I thank folks who follow the cows for our book study session. We've done a number of biographies, always love biographies because it's great to uh, just learn more, learn more about history, particularly histories that deal directly with racism. So without further ado, we will get started. Coretta Scott King, My Life, My Love, My Legacy, Context of White Supremacy, audio segment number one. Macmillan Audio presents My Life, My Love, My Legacy by Coretta Scott King As told to the Reverend Dr. Barbara Reynolds Read by Felicia Rashad and January Lavoie This CD includes a bonus PDF of the afterwords from the book. Just insert this CD into your computer to download the PDF. Introduction There is a Mrs. King. There is also Coretta. How one became detached from the other remains a mystery to me. Most people who have followed my career from afar, or even given me a second thought, know me as Mrs. King, the wife of, the widow of, the mother of, the leader of. Makes me sound like the attachments that come with my vacuum cleaner. In one sense, I don't mind that at all. I'm proud to have been a wife, a single parent, and a leader. But I am more than a label. I am also Coretta. Isn't it time you know the integrated, holistic woman? One spirit, one soul, one destiny? In reading this memoir, I hope somehow you see Coretta. As I reflect upon the chapters of my life, peering into the margins and fine print as well as the boldly illuminated headlines, 
I am simply amazed. I was born on April 27, 1927, in Highburger, Alabama, at a time and in a place where everything I would eventually become was impossible even to imagine. Who could have dreamed that a little girl who began life as a part-time hired hand picking cotton for two dollars a week in the piercing hot sun would rise to a position that allowed her to help pick U.S. mayors, congresspersons, and even presidents? Or that in the 1950s and 1960s, when a woman's place, and sometimes her imprisonment, was clearly defined as the home, I would be both an avowed homemaker and a liberated feminist. That I would be able to help build a human rights movement while also raising four beautiful children. And by no means did I dare think as a child that I could ever help create a more humane environment for African Americans. From my earliest childhood, whites regularly terrorized our family, and it was not a crime. In the 1940s and 50s, one dared not dream of equality under the law. We could not sleep in our beds without fear of being burned out by white vigilantes. We could not walk in the front door of an ice cream parlor without being shooed to the back. We had to step off the sidewalk and lower our eyes when a white person approached. This is the narrow door I entered as a young girl. It is not the same door from which I will exit. The movement did not only lift blacks. It elevated the entire nation toward a place of true respect, love, and justice that transcends race, color, or creed. I call that place the Beloved Community. The road to the Beloved Community is the road of nonviolence. The roadblocks are hate and prejudice. We are not there yet. But there are more doors open than ever before. We stand on the cusp of a new day, one brimming with possibilities that once lived only in the restricted passageways of our dreams. In my teen years, I spent a lot of time trying to discover who I was. I used to look at myself in the mirror and ponder why I had been placed on this planet. Sometimes I would grow nervous. It was as though I could perceive myself as another human being, someone much larger than a little country girl sitting on a bench in the backwoods of Alabama. I used to go out in the woods and sit for hours, thinking and meditating. Rodin's statue had nothing on me. I imagined myself seated next to the proverbial man in the moon, blasting off to adventures far past Highburger. At thirteen, that was the only way I could transcend the small space I occupied. My mind left home long before I packed my physical bags. I hope that now, in some way, you will know this, Coretta. Of course, while my memoir is about me, it is about Martin, too. Our lives were too inseparable to be perforated. Cutting us one from the other would leave a jagged edge. Yet I did have a life after Martin, just as I had a life before Martin. I have a purpose. I have a mission, and I have carried it out on the world stage. To discover what you're called to do with your life, I believe you have to be connected to God, to that divine force in your life, and that you have to continue to pray for direction. I did that. My life careened down roads I had never imagined traveling. I took on tasks requiring skills and wisdom I didn't have until circumstances demanded them. All this kept me on my knees, calling on God. Over the years, as I prayed for strength, I felt a sense of relief. I was doing God's work, I knew, and He would take care of me and my family. That didn't mean that nothing bad would ever happen. It didn't mean that at all. But pain is the price some people have to pay, and death can be a redeeming voice. It can promote change and advance the work of God's kingdom. I came to understand all this in the early days of the Montgomery movement, and the understanding I found then has never left me. I had a divine calling on my life, a charge, a challenge to serve not just black people, but all oppressed humankind. That calling will be with me to the end. As my life unfolded, I saw a pattern. My value system formed and was strengthened through pain and sacrifice, not through talking the talk, but by walking the walk in the line of fire. 
In Montgomery, Alabama, during the famous bus boycott, I came to understand what I was made of, what pressures I could withstand without breaking or running away. I was not a crystal figurine, fragile and fearful. If I had been breakable, I would have been a major distraction to Martin. His concern for my safety and that of our children would have prevented him from being able to stand in the line of fire. Instead, he soon found that I could be trusted when facing trouble. When I look back on the harassment we endured, on the persecution of my husband and the threats to our lives, I am still amazed at what lies within me. We cannot know how far we can soar until we are tested. Strangely enough, I actually become stronger in crises. I didn't understand that until I found myself in the midst of a tsunami. During that time in Montgomery, I felt an inner strength. It told me that, if necessary, I could do it again and again. Did Martin ever understand how deep my inner calling was? I don't think so. It transcended even our marriage, and he sometimes struggled to capture its essence. Once when we were talking about the importance of ensuring that our children receive a proper amount of attention from their parents, he blurted out, You see, I am called, and you are not. I said to him, You know, I've always felt that I have a call on my life, too. I have been called by God to do something, too, and I have to do it. Generally, Martin was very encouraging, and there were times when he was frustrated with himself, too. He wanted to be a father who was very involved in the lives of his children, but the movement required so much of his time. In any case, our debates about how best to take care of our children did not disturb me, because I knew exactly where he was coming from. We felt a similar pull, a similar pressure from God. I was married to Martin, but I was even more married to the movement and its mission of helping to create a beloved community of compassion, justice, and nonviolence. Was my path a lonely one? Yes, at times. You do not lose your husband, who is also your best friend, and not feel lonely. But I was never alone. I had my mother and father, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, my sister and brother, my sisters-in-law, my nieces and nephews, my four wonderful children, and the King Center— which I envisioned as the West Point of nonviolence, and often thought of as my fifth child. I also felt the warm embrace of that great crowd of witnesses, those yet unborn who will live their best lives beyond limits because we dared to struggle, to put our lives on the line, to make America and the world a better place. When I understood the places I could enter and the heights I could travel, I felt as though I were bringing many of you with me. The doors I entered were locked when I arrived, but through faith and pressure they opened. Some of you have already walked through. The lessons I learned as a lobbyist, a teacher, an organizer, and most of all, as a single parent, felt teachable by the very fact that I was not missing in action in the midst of crisis. What did it take to stay on the civil rights battlefield after Martin was assassinated? I never knew if the same hate that killed my husband would claim my life or the lives of my four children. For years, I've endured death threats. There were bomb threats when I traveled. I had to vacate buildings, get off airplanes, and choose alternate forms of transportation. You never knew the stresses and strains I underwent as a woman in a male-dominated culture, because I didn't complain, nor did I break. You never knew what it felt like to live in a fishbowl, to know that my conversations and whereabouts were constantly monitored by the government, so much so that Martin and I learned to talk in code. There was much I had to learn to do in the course of my life, and I did not have a blueprint. I could not call upon Martin as Martin had called upon me. I made mistakes, but I pray those will be charged to lack of understanding and not to malicious intent. I learned how to lobby, from city councils to state houses to Congress to the White House itself. Through these struggles and these learnings, I hope you will see Coretta. The Mrs. King you might have heard about cares about thousands around the world and the thousands yet unborn.
Coretta cares about people, one person at a time. Over the years when I heard about problems involving staff members or neighbors or church colleagues, I got personally involved. I brought gifts. To be a problem solver for those who were too easily dismissed, I called city council reps, mayors, housing departments. I called to stop eviction notices, to help students get into college. I called to recommend good people for good jobs. I was accused of being a micromanager, and I have to admit that in many cases I was that and more. I suppose Coretta the person never received much attention because I always found it difficult to talk about myself. If I talked about interactions with people, in which I was trying to make a difference in their lives one person at a time, I felt it might create the impression that these acts of kindness were staged for the media. So I kept those personal kinds of things to myself. But now is the time to share the story I have wanted to tell for so long. In my first book, My Life with Martin Luther King Jr., my focus was on my husband, a man who paid the ultimate price for his commitment to creating a better world. At that time, I felt very strongly that the book had to be about Martin. Now, I am turning the page. Now, I think it is time you knew Coretta. Coretta Scott King, Atlanta, Georgia. 1. We don't have time to cry. On Thanksgiving night, 1942, when I was 15 years old, white racists burned our house to the ground. It was the home I was born in, as were my older sister, Edith, and my younger brother, Obi Leonard. My father, Obadiah, Obi, had built it with his own hands in 1920 on my grandfather's land. The house was simple and plain, but we felt fortunate to have it. We knew scores of black sharecroppers around us who were not living on their own land, and some of their homes were little more than shacks. Shortly before bedtime, my parents smelled smoke. In what seemed like minutes, fire whipped through our home. Running for their lives, my parents grabbed my brother Obi and made it through the doorway, collapsing onto the grass. My mother's wails pierced my daddy's heart. They had escaped the flames with little more than the clothes on their backs. Edith and I were away, rehearsing for a performance with the school choir. We returned to find that many of our prized possessions, clothes, family albums, our beautiful furniture, and our prized Victrola with the Bessie Smith record collection were gone. Nothing was left of them but red coals and a dull glob of black vinyl. Our father hushed our cries and shook us from our misery. We don't have time to cry, he told us. He led us in prayer and told us to give thanks because we still had our lives. He even made us say we forgave those who had destroyed our home. I repeated the words to please my father, but I am not sure I really meant them. I was only 15, but I was not naive. In our little backwoods town of Highburger, Alabama, terrorist acts at the hands of men and women with hate in their hearts were never far from me. They came with the territory, and we had few ways to get help or justice. We had no phone to call for help, but even if we had, I knew no fire trucks would have come, nor would police or laws have protected us. In the eyes of whites, we were a black family of nobodies, living in a place that was not a real town, a mere post office address 12 miles from rural Marion, Alabama, the middle of nowhere. Ours was the same cruel reality with which blacks living throughout the South were all too familiar. In 1857, the notorious Dred Scott decision had affirmed that blacks, quote, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. In 1942, the Dred Scott decision was still the law of the land. White supremacy reigned. Antebellum laws protected the white man's way of life and made ours miserable. Not only did Dred Scott hover over us like a menacing vulture— but the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson Supreme Court decision engraved inequality in stone under the guise of separate but equal provisions. All forms of democracy were beyond our reach, including our vote, won briefly after Reconstruction following the Civil War, but circumvented through grandfather clauses, poll taxes, and outright tyranny. 
1940 study on voting practices concluded that black disenfranchisement was nearly universal in the Deep South. In Alabama, as in Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Louisiana, no more than 2.5% of Negroes of voting age cast ballots in the 1940 presidential race. In Marion, near where I lived and the surrounding countryside of Perry County, there were about 1,000 whites and 2,000 blacks, but as late as 1955, only about 150 black people were registered to vote. As if the laws weren't oppressive enough, legal restrictions were backed up by the Ku Klux Klan and mob rule. Between 1882 and 1946, there were about 3,400 lynchings in the South. One of them was of my great-uncle, who had been accused of dating a white woman, although his crime was never proven. Proof was unnecessary. All that was needed were innuendo and rumor. Whispers were enough to spark mob rule. One day a white woman showed up on my aunt's doorstep calling out, Come look! What my aunt saw, or so the story goes, was her husband hanging from a sycamore tree. His body was so riddled with bullets that it looked as though it had been used for target practice. When my family had our brush with evil the night of the fire, I saw the awful face of hate clearly, although the perpetrators were never identified. I could not see any rational reason or purpose for our being burned out of our home. But when I look back at it through the lens of time, I see those awful charred embers as preparation. That night, I witnessed faith in action. I did not see fear in my father's eyes. In fact, the very next day, he exhibited nerves of steel. He went to work like nothing had happened, no doubt looking into the faces of those who had done this horrible thing. He would not give the terrorists the satisfaction of knowing their evil acts could bend or break him. Our burned-out home served as a primer, a prelude, an introduction. The postcard from hell was my first taste of evil, the kind that shows up at your door in such a way that you can never forget its smell, its taste, its sting. That kind of ugliness would not remain in the shadows of that dark country night. No, it would follow me for the rest of my days. Fortunately, I learned early how to live with fear for the people I loved. As I would go on to face my own fiery trials, I sought to obtain that same kind of internal fortitude that my dad exemplified. He had the ability to deny people with ugly agendas the power to chase him from his mission. When fear rushed in, I learned how to hear my heart racing, but refused to allow my feelings to sway me. That resilience came from my family. It flowed through our bloodline. Before I was married to Martin and became a king, I was a proud Scot, shaped by my mother's discernment and my father's strength. Eight seven inches, but he was a powerhouse. Curiously enough, he was resented because he was a hard worker and independent. He believed in rising before the sun and would always tell us kids, get up early even if you don't do anything but sit down so you won't be lazy. By 4 a.m., hours before daybreak, he would begin to haul lumber. He was the only black man around who had a truck, which he used to transport logs. He also cut hair, collected and sold scrap iron, and did other odd jobs to pick up extra income. It seemed like my father was always being threatened especially when he hauled his lumber to the train station. The whites, who were angry because he was in competition with them, would lie in wait, stop him on the road, pull out their guns, and curse him, calling him every name they could think of. He told us he never took his eyes off them. If you look a white man straight in the eyes, he can't harm you, he said. When he was threatened, the other black men who worked with him were so frightened they would disappear into the woods, leaving my dad alone. But he never ran. If he had, they might have shot him in the back. At some point in the face of these constant threats, he began carrying a gun. Now, my daddy wouldn't have killed a soul, but he placed the gun in the glove compartment of his truck, which he left open so that anyone could see he had it. He wasn't trying to intimidate his attackers. 
He was just letting them know he wasn't unarmed. Once I overheard him telling Mother, I don't know if I'll get back tonight because they just might kill me. Every time we heard a car coming and it wasn't my dad's, my sister and I would tremble. We thought it was somebody coming to tell us our dad had been killed. After the fire, we stayed in my maternal grandfather and grandmother's house until my father found a home to rent. It was an old house, an old unpainted house, about four rooms and a big porch across the front and a well in back. Eventually, my father saved money to buy some land and build a new home. He also saved enough money to do something unheard of for a black man trying to survive in the mid-1940s. After years of hauling timber, saving his meager funds and dodging racial threats, he decided to make the giant leap to owning his own lumber mill. He even employed a white man to oversee the day's work. This courageous and history-making move by the grandson of a slave in the backwoods of Alabama only fueled the hateful intentions of the local whites, who were determined to keep black men subservient. My father had owned the sawmill for about two weeks when a logger came to him and asked to buy it. When my father refused, the logger threatened him, saying, Well, it'll never do you any good. The next Monday, when my father arrived at his sawmill, the inevitable had happened. The mill had been burned to the ground. But that didn't stop him. He was a determined man. In 1946, he started a grocery store in the building next to the new home he had built. This time, the whites allowed it to survive, and that little country store shone with a spirit of compassion. Soon he was able to add a one-pump gas station and automobile services, oil change, air for tires, and so on. Both blacks and whites patronized the store, buying groceries, often on credit, which went unpaid. Or Dad would lend folks money out of his pocket. Sometimes the borrowers would pay a little on their accounts, and he would let them charge a bigger portion. When he died in 1998, shortly before turning 100, the amount people owed him for groceries and loans over a span of 40 years added up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. He never let the mounting debt worry him. Unlike my father, who generally blamed conditions rather than people for the way blacks were treated, my mother, Bernice McMurray Scott, was more resentful of the racist people around us. You just can't trust whites, she would say. In later years, she did develop friendships with whites, which was only natural, since her mother, Molly McMurray, my grandmother, was part Irish. My mother was fair-skinned with high cheekbones and straight black hair. Usually she wore her hair in two braids that reached almost to her waist. She looked like an American Indian, as she took after her father, Martin McMurray, who was part Native American. She had a pioneering spirit, which went against the grain not only for what whites expected of Negro women, but for what Negro men expected as well. In the 1920s, she was the first black woman in our community to drive a car. Later, she learned how to drive a truck, and eventually a school bus converted from a truck. She was also quite musically inclined, singing solos and playing the piano at church on Sundays, and I credit her for my musical abilities. My mother had a sweet disposition, but she was a no-nonsense kind of person. She did not gossip about people. Down on the farm with nothing much to do, some folks made it their habit to visit with one another and talk about other people's business. Mother had an expression, seldom visits make long friends. In other words, friendships will be longer lasting if you don't go visiting much. When you do, there's the tendency toward idle gossip and the potential to have conflicts and to fall out. Years later, when Martin and I moved to Montgomery, he used to ask me, why don't you go visit some of the members or some of the women in the church? I would tell him, I'm perfectly satisfied to be home. I enjoy being by myself, while my mother's words echoed in my head. Seldom visits make long friends. My mother, who lived to be 92, was a good judge of people, too. She had what they called discernment. She loved to help others and was very compassionate, but she needed to know people, and she didn't warm up to you until she knew you. She had to look you over and feel you out. Once she felt that you were okay, she would do anything in the world for you.
I must admit I'm a lot like her. I've never warmed up to people quickly. Once I feel comfortable, though, I'm very open. Unfortunately, this quality has often been interpreted as aloofness, just like with my mother. Because she had a fair complexion, people thought she was stuck up. But she was not arrogant, and neither am I. She just believed in minding her own business, though she was always there when you needed her, and was a very giving person when you got to know her. She was not about to let people take advantage of her, however, and I am a lot like that, too. A day came when I had to ask my mother the same questions every black child asked sooner or later. Why am I treated differently? Why do whites hate us so? My mother answered in much the same way black mothers have answered for generations. You are just as good as anyone else, she said. You get an education. Then you won't have to be kicked around. The value of education was a constant drumbeat from my mother, and I cannot remember a time when I didn't know I was going to college. After all, my mother said I would. Despite the fact that, unfortunately for most blacks in the South, education was virtually out of reach when I was growing up. Where we lived in Perry County, free education did not exist for blacks beyond the sixth grade. And while whites attended school for nine months a year, in general, blacks were entitled to go for only three months. Mother had a fourth grade education, and father made it through one year of high school before deficient funds forced him to quit. Nevertheless, both of them had high ideals for their children, and they prayed that a way would open for us to achieve the educational goals they had been denied. My mother, who sounded like the feminists of today, even in the 1950s, would stress, if you get an education and try to be somebody, you won't have to depend on anyone, not even a man. My mother married my father when she was 17. I believe she wished she had not married so young. I remember her saying, I never was a child. I've been a woman all my life. That was not the kind of life she wanted for me and my sister. If and when we married, she wanted us to be more than just a wife. When her sister, who attended Tuskegee Institute, the college started by Booker T. Washington, talked about the excitement of college, you could almost see the wheels turning in my mother's head. It was radical for my mother to have such thoughts in those days. At that time, the ideal husband took care of his wife as if she were his property. She was assigned to the home and to child-rearing. I was intrigued by the thought that, as a woman, I could have my own goals that went beyond merely being dependent on a man, though I did want to marry and have children. As exciting as it was to think I could aspire to something beyond cooking and cleaning the house, I absorbed the derogatory examples I saw of how women and blacks were treated, and I wondered how all that could change. I saw white children riding yellow checkered buses to their school, yet in all kinds of weather, we black children walked three miles to our one-room schoolhouse and three miles back home. Somehow, the driver of the white children would manage to steer the bus so that it kicked dust in our faces or slopped mud on our clothes, to the delight of his passengers who often cheered as he sped by us. I attended elementary school before the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education suit knocked down Plessy v. Ferguson, which sanctioned separate but equal education. Our education was not designed to be equal to that of the white students. It was meant to keep us separate and isolated from resources so that we remained on the bottom rung. When I realized how inferior our little one-room schoolhouse was to the school attended by whites, I resented them. Though I never set foot in it, the White's Elementary School was in a nice brick building with all sorts of equipment. In ours, we had no labs, no library, and only a few books, most of which were tattered and out of date. More than a hundred children in grades one through six were crammed into one big room. While the Whites received books for free, we had to pay for ours, and most of us couldn't afford them. Though our resources were inferior, however, our teachers were superior. They loved us and expected us to excel, as did our parents. As strange as it may seem, despite the terrifying instances of white hate and the pervasiveness of racism, most of my childhood was happy. 
My parents provided a nurturing environment, and most of the people in our all-black community were kinfolk. And I had siblings, Edith, older than me by two years, and Obi, younger by three, whom I adored. Edith was the bookworm. Obi was the fixer who could repair anything. I was the doer, a workaholic always looking for a project. As children, we didn't have money for store-bought games or toys, so we fashioned our own. One of our favorite pastimes was swinging. We would take an old tire, attach a rope to it, tie it to a tree, and that would be our swing. We also climbed trees and played Little Sally Walker. There were other things we wanted to do, but we had to accept that we just could not do them. There were no recreation facilities for black children. Marion had a swimming pool, but blacks were not allowed to use it. I tried to learn to swim in a pond instead and almost drowned. The experience was so frightening that I never learned to swim as an adult. I never grew past it, and it affected me deeply. Still, I felt secure growing up surrounded by kin. Cousins and all my half-uncles and half-aunts from Grandfather Scott's second marriage— in the close-knit community of Marion's North Perry County. Marion, first called Muckle Ridge, had been renamed in honor of General Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, hero of the American Revolution. Whites took pride in the fact that a Marion schoolteacher designed the first Confederate flag and the Confederate uniform. None of that much mattered to blacks. We took pride in knowing that our all-black community represented three generations of black ownership. My grandfather, Jeff Scott, and my grandmother, Cora, owned 300 acres of land, which produced pine timber for sale and vegetables of every kind, and which fed our family and provided leftovers for others. More than anything else... This tradition of land ownership helped to instill in us racial pride, self-respect, and dignity. We were self-reliant, as reliant as any black could be in the racist South. Our grandfathers hoped that they could pass on to future generations this legacy of land ownership. In many ways, their wishes were realized. The Scots still own hundreds of acres of land in Alabama, land that I farmed as a girl. From age six, when I was barely able to hold a hoe, I worked our fields. We raised corn, peas, potatoes, and garden vegetables. We also had hogs, chickens, and cows. Edith and I both had to milk a cow every day. Not only did we milk them, but we'd take them to the pasture and bring them back in the evening. Sometimes we had to go to the pasture late at night to get the cows. There would be no moon, and it'd be so dark you couldn't see your feet before you. Sometimes the cows weren't at the gate and we'd have to keep calling them until we heard their bells tinkling. Only then would we know where to find them and we would run after them. Most always we were barefoot, so we ran praying all the way that we wouldn't step on a snake. When the Depression deepened in the late 1930s and I was about ten years old, my sister and I began working as hired hands picking cotton. Oh, Lord, I chopped and picked plenty of cotton to help pay for our schooling. We would be picked up before the crack of dawn and taken to the fields, which were quite a distance away. We'd work from sun up to sundown, sometimes to earn only 60 cents a day, though that was good money in the Depression years. They'd always have a white male overseer to keep us working. The overseer would be ahead of us, trying to make everybody catch up with him. I was always competitive, so I kept up, and he bragged about me, saying, whenever I needed help, I would come straight to Obi Scott's house and get it. In an effort to keep Edith from getting behind, I would often hoe her row, then come back to mine. The sun was scalding hot, and I'd be so tired at the end of the twelve-hour days that I would nearly drop. But I was proud of my cotton-picking skills, because my abilities furthered our hopes of getting an education. I had to pick a hundred pounds of cotton to get sixty cents. Later, it got to be as much as a dollar for a hundred pounds. Once, I picked two hundred nine pounds in a day and received two dollars and nine cents, a tidy sum back then. When Edith finished her elementary education at Crossroads School, our family pooled the money we earned to help her go to the Hale County Training School. 
Because of the lack of educational opportunities in our community, my daddy had to pay for her room and board away from home in the town of Greensboro, Alabama. Yet I never heard anyone complain. My mother always said that we were going to get an education even if she had to sacrifice to the point where she had only one dress to wear. The fact that Edith was going to continue her schooling made me even more confident that I would too. My mother's determination that I get an education made me understand that there was something wonderful awaiting me. If that weren't the case, why would she continue to be so insistent on my being prepared? I may not have known exactly where I was going, but I was excited about getting there. Somewhere. I would think of Judy Garland singing about a place somewhere over the rainbow. I kept looking and hoping that my somewhere would come. A deeply religious child, I placed my faith in God to provide answers and a path. I would ponder his awesome work, how he had put the universe, the planets, and the galaxies together, and yet he hadn't forgotten about me down on the farm. I would rock back and forth, count the stars, listen to the wind rustle around the pine cones, and wonder who I was, why I was on the planet, and where my place was in such a grand display of celestial artistry. In relationship to all I could see, would my life be like a pinpoint, a windmill, a shooting star, or a blade of grass to be trampled underfoot? Isolated in the rural South, black and female, I didn't see much to suggest that I could have a bright future, except for my parents' coaching. Most of the signals I received from the outside world were red lights warning me to stop, to back up my dreams. At the same time, I felt an inner self in motion. She was excited and ready to go. But where? I didn't know. I used to sit at the mirror for hours, staring, trying to figure out who I was. Why am I here? I know God made me, but why? I would stare for so long, and my mind would wander so far away that I grew frightened. Sometimes I felt I was looking at another person. It was like I wanted answers and wasn't getting them fast enough, so my imagination, my mind, would take off without me. I was quite good at dreamwalking. When I was a child, church was the center of my social life. I can't remember a time when I didn't go to services at Mount Tabor AME Zion, about four miles from our home. Most people walked the distance barefoot because they didn't want to get their Sunday shoes dirty. Some of the men carried a rag, which they would slap across their leather shoes to give them luster when they neared the church. From my child's eye, Mount Tabor was a huge white frame structure, unspoiled even by its cracking and peeling white paint. It was heated by a pot-bellied stove. Kerosene lamps provided the light. Both my grandfathers were church leaders. Grandfather Scott would often open the Sunday school service by singing a hymn or leading a prayer. Grandfather McMurray, who had a fine baritone voice, would line the hymns, setting the pitch for the choir to join in. While I had hopes and dreams, I also had fears that sometimes kept me awake at night. At Mount Tabor, the preachers talked a lot about sin, damnation, and hell. These fired-up sermons kept me on edge. I was afraid of committing sins that would condemn me to burn in hell instead of joining God in that mysterious heaven hidden beyond the clouds. When I was ten, I heard about a lady who was on her deathbed. She had been forgiven by God for everything but cutting her hair. My mother had cut my hair, and for a spell I was obsessed with the idea that cutting my hair might send me to hell. Even after I was married, I didn't like to cut my hair, though I don't believe that childhood obsession was the reason. It was Martin. He used to say, Corey, that's your trademark. Don't cut your hair. When the older folks thought it was about time for children to join the church, they would send us to the mourner's bench. One night, when I was about ten, we were having a revival. Every night, the preacher was preaching up a storm. During the revival, I was told to sit on that bench where the sisters of the church would mourn and pray over me until they were satisfied that I had religion. They kept telling me I was going to hell because I was so mean. 
I didn't think I was mean, although I would fight a lot. I guess I was pretty straight-laced, and I thought I was right about everything. When anybody disagreed with me, I would haul off and sock them. I was very strong, and I could beat up both my sister and brother. But I didn't know how they knew all that at church. Maybe God had told them, I thought, and I cried out of shame. The more I cried, the more they mourned and prayed. Everything became so intense and emotional that I thought I felt something, and I stood up and joined the church. It was there at Mount Tabor AME Zion that my love of music and my future career were born. Edith and I would often sing duets, and by the time I was fifteen, I was directing the choir and leading such songs as Does Jesus Care? Yes, my Jesus cares. Yes, my Jesus cares. The song was sung softly and somberly. Our church was not what you would call a shouting church. We left that to the more emotional Baptists. As a faithful teenager, it was hard for me to reconcile the lessons of Christian living I learned in church with the way whites who also called themselves Christians behaved toward us. Sometimes our father would take us to town on Saturdays, where we were greeted by whites-only signs and made to go to the back door to get a sandwich. When we bought ice cream, we had to wait until all the whites had been served. No matter what flavor I asked for, the druggist would usually give me vanilla, served at the back door. Such treatment made me question whether my skin color was something I could rub off, since it seemed to be the cause of the problem. But church was an escape and a sanctuary from these daily degradations, and it sustained our faith that the Red Sea would be parted and opportunities would await us on the other side. It is often said that the soul attracts that which it secretly harbors. Mother and I continued to harbor a vision, not out of desperation but out of faith, that I would get the chance to continue my education. Then an opportunity opened that pushed me closer to an understanding of my purpose. Mother figured out a way to send me to Lincoln Normal School, a semi-private high school founded by former slaves and supported by the American Missionary Association in Marion. She sent both me and Edith there. The AMA, an anti-slavery society founded by congregational ministers and laypersons in 1846, provided some of the best education for blacks in the South. Lincoln's faculty was mixed, half white, half black, and most were from the North. The white faculty treated the Negro students with love. They were dedicated. For that very reason, most of the white townspeople in Marion despised the teachers and delighted in calling them nigger lovers. There were no dormitories at Lincoln during the years that I attended, and to drive back and forth from Marion to Lincoln each day would have been too burdensome, so I had to stay with other families to be able to attend the school. That was fine with me. I was quite excited to enroll, and felt nurtured and embraced in Lincoln's halls, though when I tried to take a job doing housework for a white woman in Marion to supplement my parents' stipend, she expected me to be docile, to scrape and bow and use the back door. Her requests made me feel unworthy. To consent to her demands would have meant that I agreed with her negative assessment of me. I was not then, or ever, the submissive, subservient type. That job didn't last. Regardless of these challenges, at Lincoln I knew I was being shaped for my destiny. This shaping was not the work of human hands, but suggested a divine intervention. I had been plucked from the middle of nowhere, where I was surrounded by islands of hostility and placed in an environment of enlightenment. White teachers saw worth in me. In time, I saw past the terrible symbols of burning crosses, hateful words, and malicious intent, and discovered that there were real, loving people under a skin color that so often meant trouble or heartache for our community. My white teachers laughed, cried, went to church, and attended county fairs. Underneath the skin the skin that had been so foreboding to me, were people with good hearts and fair minds. It was important for me to understand this. As a child who had seen mostly the worst behavior of whites, it was critical for me to see a better side, and I feel now that these early contacts were divine connections. 
they reached me before the meanness that I had seen could create cement walls of enmity within my soul. Inside the protective walls of Lincoln, my horizons were expanded. I began to understand more about being connected to a larger society and to people outside my community. Despite the reaction of the townspeople, the devotion of the dedicated faculty was richly rewarded by the harvest they produced. A study conducted by the late Horace Mann Bond in the 1950s found that the largest number of blacks with PhDs in the nation had roots right there in Perry County, of which Marion was a part. Another illustration of the school's influence was revealed at the 25th reunion of the Lincoln Class of 1943, at which the assembled graduates discovered that all their children who were old enough were either attending college or had completed four years of education at an institution of higher learning. This was Lincoln's influence. It's also interesting that three major civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph D. Abernathy, and Andrew Young, married women from Perry County, two of whom attended Lincoln. Jean Childs, who was three grades behind me at Lincoln, graduated from Manchester College in Indiana, became a special education teacher, and married Young. Juanita Jones, from Uniontown, Alabama, attended Selma University, a prestigious K-12 boarding school for Negro children, and graduated from Tennessee State University. She became a teacher and married Ralph Abernathy. Many of the faculty impressed me, showing me the kind of person I wanted to become, but one of them in particular, my music teacher, Miss Olive J. Williams, a Howard University graduate, became my first role model outside of my family. She played the piano, directed the chorus, and taught us beginning voice and music appreciation. She had us singing Handel's Messiah, which was unusual for a high school in the South in that era. As we went through the vocal exercises, she also taught us posture and good diction, and introduced me to the world of classical music and composers like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and Chopin. Before seventh grade, I had never heard classical music. Upon hearing it, I loved it. We learned of the great concert performers of the day, some of whom were black. There was world-famous baritone Paul Robeson. There was Marian Anderson, the world's greatest contralto, and Roland Hayes, one of the great tenors. Learning about them made me dare to dream that I, too, could become a concert artist. Quakers also served on the staff at Lincoln, and they started introducing us to peace activists— I met the great pacifist and peace activist Bayard Rustin, who would later play a key role with my husband and me in the civil rights movement, right there in ninth grade. At Lincoln, he addressed the student assembly and spoke about India's struggle for independence from the British Empire through the power of nonviolence. He told us how the British beat the Indians to a pulp, but in the end the Indians won their independence without firing a single shot. In a climate so punctuated by violence, I was fascinated by Rustin's lecture on how conflict could be resolved without war or bloodshed. I pondered the idea and filed it away in my memory. Lincoln presented a ray of hope for me. Still, this was a small island in a vast sea of racial hostility. It was not enough. Like so many blacks, I knew I had to migrate from the South. I needed a place to chase my dream— a dream that didn't have a name or a shape, but that awaited me nonetheless. It was like a pull, a gentle tug with a sharp edge of urgency. I had to escape, to get out of Alabama. Thousands of blacks had left before me, either chased out by the tyranny of white folks or led by visions of a better life in a northern promised land. Shortly before my birth, the steady flow of migration began. Southern blacks deserted their marginal farms and sharecropping in droves. By 1923, nearly 500,000 blacks had resettled in the North. In 1930, one Negro out of every five lived above the Mason-Dixon line. After World War II, another three million left. Some were like my uncle, Army Sergeant Jasper Scott, who became embittered when he saw that German POWs were treated with more respect than black native sons. After fighting in the war, returning to the South briefly and working with my father, 
he moved to Cleveland rather than fight another war at home with Southern whites. The South was losing not only its farming class, but also the so-called Talented Tenth, those black men and women who sought higher education and resources to improve their lives and the lives of others. My escape route opened up through Lincoln. My sister Edith sang alto with a musical group called the Lincoln School Little Chorus. Lincoln faculty members, and later good friends of Edith's and mine, Francis and Cecil Thomas, arranged for the chorus to go on tour, and one of the stopping points was Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Obviously, the chorus impressed Antioch such that two years later, when the college decided to open its doors wider to blacks by granting a limited number of scholarships, Antioch officials contacted Lincoln to request its two top students. Edith, who was valedictorian, applied and was accepted. After passing a test, she received a letter offering her a full scholarship, tuition plus room and board. So, in the summer of 1943, Edith became, for a time, the only black student at Antioch College. She wrote me glowing letters about the respect she received there, so after graduating as valedictorian of my class, I too applied and was accepted in 1945. And so it was that one of my mother's lifelong dreams for me, as well as my own, was coming true. I was going to college. Context of white supremacy, that is the first audio segment, My Life, My Love, My Legacy, autobiography of Coretta Scott King, as told to Reverend Dr. Barbara Reynolds. Uh, that's what we'll pick up at uh, for the second audio segment. We'll be on Chapter 2, A Sense of Belonging. The number to dial if you would like to participate, 641-715-3640. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to to participate. Cows listeners, I think you all know someone else who is an alumnus of Antioch College in Ohio. The number again, 641-715-3640. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star 6 if you would like to participate. If you do not want to use your phone to dial in, you can use the free Vope line. It is linked at Black Talk Radio Network. If you need the address, it is tiny, T-I-N-Y dot C-C forward slash one race. And that is the number one. Address again, tiny, T-I-N-Y dot C-C forward slash one race. And that is the number one. When you put in that address, click the link on the left of the page. Uh, it should say free vote line. When you click that, it will open a small window on your screen. First line, it's a drop down menu. Select the number that I just gave out, which again is 641 715 3640. The next line, it will ask for a code. That code again is 564 nine four three final line it will ask for a name you can put in a real name a nickname you can press random keys whatever you're comfortable with once you get that information entered click the green button at the bottom that should connect you to the live broadcast it is the same procedure click uh, number one you'll see the dial pad on your screen press star six you're here an audio prompt to press the number one, press the number one, and that should take care of it. If you have any uh, problems, confusion, feel free to drop an email until justice at gmail.com. With that, uh, we'll get to folks who dialed in. I just did want to say uh, quickly, I was a little nervous, a little nervous about uh, this book, even though the first uh, place that I saw 
Uh, Because this book, as I said, it just came out a few weeks ago. The first place that I saw, the first review, rather, that I read, it was in the New Orleans Tribune. Uh, For folks, if you've been listening to the cows uh, for a while, Anitra Brown, uh, she's been a guest on the program repeatedly. Uh, She's the editor uh, at the New Orleans Tribune. She, She and their staff have done phenomenal work on Hurricane Katrina. Uh, they talked about that on the program when we were here, and uh, it was just really important, I thought, uh, the fact that they said that was such uh, a great book, uh, the autobiography, and I said, hey, if they recommended it strongly, we should check it out. Anywho, uh, we'll get to folks who dialed in to see what thoughts they have, uh, and then I'll share some of my thoughts as well. Folks who dialed in uh, who have a hand up, uh, line should be open. Uh, feel free. Can, okay. Uh, can I get started? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, greetings, everyone, and uh, greetings. Uh, just like to start off, you probably will have to stop me because I got so much written down here, uh, which is okay. <laughs> uh, just for to mention that uh, there's a lot of similarities with my, my own mother, some of the things that she was saying, including my mother was born in the same year, uh, 1927. Uh, and uh, I can relate to hearing about the inferior schools uh, from my mother's family who, who uh, came from Cordell, Georgia. Uh, the school buses uh, of whites flying by and, 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 and splashing mud on, on, on the uh, black children as they were uh, en route to school, most of them barefooted that sort of thing, and you can hear the white kids laughing at them and, and you know, throwing stuff at them, that sort of thing. Uh, the horrendous terror uh, that was always around. Uh, same stories that I've heard when I was a child, uh, although they kind of, like, insulated us from it to really get down to detail. Uh, advanced, I uh, have that here, advanced upbringing, probably better than the day as far as some of those things that she was saying, you know, with the access to land and the things that you could get from the ground, especially during that time when, you know, pesticides and all of that kind of stuff wasn't as prevalent as it is today. Uh, and the ability to, to grasp from the ground in one hand and come up in the other hand with a finished product. Uh, uh, most of us uh, don't have that kind of training nowadays. Uh, we may have more money, but we don't have that kind of training. Like, obviously, like uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, King uh, did and a lot of non-white black people during that time. Uh, my, mother, my mother had the same goals for her children. Uh, y'all are listening to the, her worst one, to, to tell you the truth. But, uh, but the idea of having all of her children go to college, uh, especially her boys, she said, uh, because she wanted them to be the quote unquote man of the house, that sort of thing. And, uh, not only she accomplished that with her sons, but also her two daughters, uh, as far as that concern. Uh, I have down here, uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, on how her mother, uh, also had a, a sound counter racist code, uh, by not visiting people unless you, uh, you, you have an agenda. You have a reason to come by their place. And don't be spending a whole lot of time around people's place. That's an excellent uh, uh, counter-racist code uh, still today for non-white black people especially to have. And uh, I recall the part where she mentioned about uh, uh, the uh, quote-unquote good white people. Uh, I, I said to myself, I bet, I bet uh, these, those nigger lovers uh, uh, that they were allowed to patronize everything in that town <laughs> as far as they could say. They, they, they showed up, would allow them to uh, 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 use the facilities and everything else that they uh, can spend their money to get in that town. I bet that, as opposed to how they handled the black people. Uh, and also on that subject, I have uh, finding, the quote-unquote, finding good white people it must be a, a very important strategy in the system of racism and white supremacy. It, 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 basically what I'm saying is I think that, that uh, the, the, the white collective allows a segment of white people to be very nice to us 
for that deceiving purpose. Uh, that's just a thought that I have. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the word escaping. And, that, and, that, and I think that's a correct, uh, it was a correct word during that time to use. Uh, that, that's something that I heard through my entire childhood about, about I got to get out of here, we got to get out of here, that sort of thing. And that was a thought in mind. And not only is a uh, South uh, Alabama problem, it's a global problem that still exists in the day. And that's all I have for right now. Thank you. Appreciate that, retired firefighter. Uh, other folks that we haven't heard from? Yes, may I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, greetings, guys. Greetings to the other callers and listeners. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the retired firefighter's commentary because you know, it's it's similar to my own. My father and mother were were born around uh, that same year as uh, Mrs. King, and endured some of the same uh, things. Uh, but what I found interesting, you know, she said that <clears throat> uh, life was like living in a fishbowl, and that. Uh, she had to get off planes and find another forms of transportation. The, I guess the FBI had uh, wiretapped their homes and her and the Dr. King had to talk in code. Uh, she mentioned that she was married, you know, not only to Dr. King, but <clears throat> to the civil rights uh, struggle. And, you know, it's so many of these uh, biographies uh, or alike in a way that a grandparent was either killed by white people or lynched. She mentioned <clears throat> 400 lynchings, you know, during that time and how a white woman came to tell her grandmother, you know, to come out and look at her husband, you know, swinging from a tree. You know, <clears throat> we can't underestimate the, the racist white woman. And um, let's see, her, I think her father was a grandson of an enslaved person. And I like to use the word enslaved person rather than slave because <clears throat> no one is born a slave or uh, wears that title they are oppressed, enslaved individuals. And one other thing, uh, you know, where during that time before the Great Depression, a lot of, of black students did not have the resources to uh, get an education. And <clears throat> they were afforded uh, a chance to go to school. Well, there were many, many more, you know, black uh, students during that time that did not have that opportunity. And she excelled in school, her and her sister both. <clears throat> but the, uh, I guess it was the Lincoln School. The, well, they went to uh, elementary school. I don't know what the name of that one was. Overcrowdedness in all of them. Inferior uh, conditions overcrowdedness, having to pay for school books. And I was surprised to learn that uh, she had picked cotton also. I did not know that uh, 12 hours a day in the hot sun and working in white people's homes. And also I was uh, surprised that, you know, after all she had endured and what she had heard and when it happened to her family, she still had uh, some good things to say about those white teachers at a historically African-American school. Uh, it's just phenomenal how, like the retired fire, firefighter said, that we look for good white people. And, you know, which, you know, at this point, I don't believe that there are any. 
But I'll mute my line and give somebody else a chance. Thanks for taking the call, Good. <clears throat> for sure. Uh, other folks that we... Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings to you, Gus. Um, to Mr. Denry Four and to the firefighter in Florida, brilliant observations. Um, just to piggyback off of what uh, Mr. Denry just said, Um, because he reminded me of it. My victim mind uh, just slipped me before I got on the line. But um, that's something that I've said for a very, very, very long time, that white people have done an incredible job at uh, psychosocially conditioning black people to sift through all of the trash mayonnaise white people to find that one good so-called diamond in the rough white person that's going to treat you right. But if you look at white people, they never do that. They always look at us collectively as the same subhuman beast. And that's how I look at all white people. I look at all white people exactly how they look at me. I don't trust them. I, they're all the same. They're all racist white supremacists. So the way that they actually look at us is how I look at them. And um, that is absolutely correct on um, what Mr. Demery and uh, the firefighter in Florida said. Um, it's very interesting. Um, uh, Mrs. King was actually about 16 years a senior to my mother. Um, if, if I remember her saying she was 15 in uh, 1942, my mother was born in uh, actually 16 years a senior of my father. My mother was born in 49. And I remember growing up and reading a, a biography that my father gave me of Dr. King. And they had a picture of them. I believe it was on the cover or in the actual book, they had a few pictures. And I always thought that Mrs. King, my mother favored Mrs. King. They kind of looked similar. It was something that used to really mess with me when I was young. So just reading this book and seeing her picture on the cover just gave me that flashback. Um, Even though you talked about some of the people might be um, upset with their views on racism, I really look past all of that. They're victims just like I am. And, you know, at one point in my life, I looked at white people very differently than I do, too. I just found um, actually on Chapter 1, the the first page of Chapter 1 at the bottom, she writes, "Um, our, Our father hushed our cries and shook us from our misery. We don't have time to cry, he told us. He led us in prayer and told us to give thanks because we still had our lives. He even made us say we forgave uh, those who had destroyed our home. I repeated the words to please my father, but I'm not sure I really meant them. I just thought of black self-respect, even as a teenager. um, She was logically looking at what these people did and had the proper response of not liking them, obviously, and then sadly, because her parents were more confused victims, and obviously I'm pretty sure they had the, the really heavy Christian leaning, that the act of forgiveness was more important, um, sadly cultivated to be more important than uh, black self-respect. But I thought that was really great for her to be so young and have such an insightful approach to what was done to her and her family so many times. It's tragic. Um, on, the, on page 10, Uh, She writes, uh, it seemed like my father was always being threatened, especially when he hauled his lumber to the train station. The whites who were angry because he was in competition with them would lie in wait, stop him on the road and pull out their guns and curse him, calling him every name they could think of. He told us he never took his eyes off of them. If you look a white man straight in the eyes, he can't harm you, he said. When he was threatened, the other black men who worked with him were so frightened they would disappear into the woods, leaving my dad alone. But he never ran. If he had, they might have shot him in the back. And I found that interesting, made me immediately think of the brilliance of the illustrious Neely Fuller Jr. um, when he talks about, uh, as we handle our counter-racist business, understand that we are alone. (laughs) You are going to be left alone and people are going to run in the woods. And um, even though her father had the impression that looking them in the eyes, they can't hurt you. We knew, we know that they could have and possibly would have under the right circumstances shot him, shot him in the head. But ultimately um, just that act of black self-respect, I think like she um, posited might've saved his life. If he did turn his back, they probably would have shot him in the back. That's what white people do. They're cowards. But um, ultimately, just him looking them in the eye was an act of black self-respect itself. And I found that to be very um, interesting. On the following paragraph, she writes, at some point in the face of these constant threats, he began carrying a gun. Now, my daddy wouldn't have killed a soul, but he placed the gun in the glove compartment of his truck, which he left open so that anyone could see that he had it. He wasn't trying to intimidate his attackers. He was just letting letting them know he wasn't unarmed. Once I overheard him telling 
Mother, I don't know if I'll get back tonight because they just might kill me. Every time we heard a car coming and it wasn't my dad's, my sister and I would tremble. We thought it was somebody coming to tell us our dad had been killed. And I just thought, wow, that's what psychological terrorism looks like. When you have to be a child and no different from your mother, yourself and your sister are sitting there, uh, you know, terrified just because you heard a car in your driveway or pulling up towards your home that was not your parents' car and you assumed the worst because that's the way white people function. Just terrible, terrible um, that, that her and her family had to go through that. Um, on the following page, uh, she wrote, but that didn't stop him. He was a determined man. In 1946, he started a grocery store in a building next to the new home he had built. This time, the whites allowed, him, allowed it to survive, and that little country store uh, shone with a spirit of compassion. Soon, he was able to add one pump, a one-pump gas station and automobile service for oil change, for, um, air for tires, and so on. Both blacks and whites patronized the store, buying groceries, often on credit, which went unpaid. Or dad would lend folks money out of his pocket. Sometimes the borrowers would pay a little on their account, and he would let them charge a bigger portion. When he died in 1998, which I found to be amazing, shortly before turning 100, the amount of people the amount, excuse me, people owed him for groceries and loans over a span of 40 years added up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and he never left, let the mounting debt worry him. Just blew my mind, just um, even in the midst of straight terror, that he was able to look at these poverty-stricken black people, um, and it sounds like some other uh, dirt road white people that were surrounding him, and was still able to function with a sense of compassion and justice, understanding that these pe people were not making enough and were not uh, given the proper equity and justice to be able to afford the products that he was selling. I just find that to be extremely amazing acts of black self-respect and uh, a brilliant foundation, in my opinion, for what laid uh, the, the rest of her life to come uh, on her own as well as with her husband. There's a few other points I really wanted to get to because this is the amazing first chapter, but I will stop there and I'm allowing the people to uh, to speak and hopefully I'll get a chance to chime in again later. Thanks again, Gus, and I think this is a great book. I think it's going to be a winner. I'll meet my line. Right on. Uh, I'll nab other hands as I see them. Uh, if other folks have additional comments that they want to get in, uh, that's fine as well. Um, I, as I said, when I when I saw the review in the New Orleans Tribune, black journalists, uh, when I saw their review, uh, was <clears throat> uh, had so many positive things to say and the reasons why they thought it was such a constructive read. Uh, in addition to uh, the co-author, uh, the Reverend Dr. Barbara Reynolds, uh, she's an acclaimed black journalist. She did a lot of coverage of the uh, what's called the civil rights movement. So. Uh, I thought that would have a bad. This is not like written by Rebecca Skloot, right? Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks or some white person, because uh, we've had a lot of those uh, types of book. This is not the case. So uh, I thought this would be uh, good. The first, first chapter and introduction I thought were constructive for so many reasons. Uh, let's see. Some of the notes that I took, I was reminded of some of the other books that we've read just in a little bit that we heard this week. Um, Warmth of Other Sons, I think that book, uh, as well as uh, The Half Has Never Been Told by Edward Baptist. Isabel Wilkerson was here this week. She was in Seattle. I found out the night after the event was over. It was sold out, so it would have been a uh, tough ticket. White people are very informed uh, in these parts. But, yeah, I was I was so upset. The lovely Isabel Wilkerson was right here in Seattle just days ago. Uh, but uh, Edward Baptist, uh, The Half Has Never Been Told, I think he has extensive segments of the book where they talk about uh, slave records and how many pounds of cotton a black person was forced uh, to pick for no money. And I think some of the figures that we heard then were staggering. Uh, I think Solomon Northup, too, we read that as well, where they were talking about 300, 400 pounds of cotton being picked in a day. And we were, you know, even even questioning, is that feasible? Are they lying here? Are they exaggerating? We have, again, a black person, uh, Coretta Scott King, no less, <laughs> saying that she picked 200, uh, excuse me, 200 pounds of cotton as a child, no less. So, uh, I would have to think, yeah, it's yeah, unless, you know, we think all these people are, are lying, including Coretta Scott, are lying about their cotton uh, cotton picking experience uh, that, wow, that is incredible. That sort of backbreaking labor out in the sun. Uh, I can't even I can't fathom doing that for an hour. Um, details, details. Uh, I took a lot of notes uh, during this section. 
Uh, I just had to write the word trauma down uh, from the first, like the first, really the whole, maybe the whole book, uh, but certainly intensely the first chapter. Um, and I just think that, you know, I'll hear a lot of times, like I said, people disagree with me. People disagree with everybody. Uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, I'm sure it's, there's no one where, you know, you're going to agree with 100 percent of their views. And I know a, a, a number of people have a significant different opinion, a different philosophy. They are not into nonviolence. They do not think that there are good white people. Uh, they do not think that white people can be redeemed. They are not Christians and, in fact, think that Christianity has been successfully and efficiently used to terrorize, enslave black people, non-white people worldwide. Um, we've had a lot of folks who presented those views on the program. Even with all of that, in my view, I think it is so critically important uh, to keep in mind, even if it's someone where you disagree with, with every stance that they take on every issue of racism, white supremacy, that this victim, talking about Coretta Scott King specifically, uh, that growing up and having her house bombed, having racists, white terrorists, white race soldiers come and burn down her family's business. Uh, just repeated attacks. What happened? I mean, just I was stunned just hearing all of this information. I've said consistently is this. They are st any victim of racism. If you knew enough about that person and how they have been terrorized and abused, sometimes if that person even knew themselves about how much they have been terrorized and abused under the system of white supremacy, I think I hope we would begin to have a little bit more compassion and well maybe I won't call him a coon today. They have really got on my nerves and I don't agree with them, but I understand that they are a victim of racism, white supremacy. I'm going to try my best to be patient, uh, just understanding some of the things that they went through. So I, I really uh, appreciated them just taking the time to kind of uh, tell her, I mean, just growing up in Alabama, no less, all the things that we've heard about uh, Alabama uh, with the Montgomery bus boycott that I guess we'll get more details as we get further along into the book but the Scottsboro uh, boys case I mean infamous uh, where their house was, I guess we'll get more on that their house being bombed uh, later with Coretta Scott King but just infamous this area the bombing of the uh, Birmingham Baptist Church which I'm sure we'll hear about later uh, for her to grow up in this state in this era this time period and all of the things that were just routine. Uh, I'll try and pick out some of the specific notes uh, and then make time for other people. I think like a uh, retired firefighter had a, a lot of notes uh, during the, the brief little segment of the book that we read thus far. Uh, let's see. 15 years old. I just finished writing uh, about the missing uh, black teens, uh, young girls in Washington, D.C., and comparing that to uh, what is called the Atlanta child murders and just these traumas happening to black children um, to have this your house burned down at 15 by racists, not just to have the house catch on fire. I mean, that could happen for a variety of reasons, but to have it specifically be an act of of white terrorism where I would take that they're intending to kill you. This is not just arson. This is arson. And we're going to kill these niggers uh, to experience that as a child and the repeated traumas that she had throughout her life. Uh, that, that alone, I think is something to just, you know, pause uh, for the relentless way that she lived and continuing to talk about uh, racism until her death in uh, 2006. Um, yeah, I thought it, uh, the, I thought it was significant, her even titling the first chapter, uh, We Don't Have Time to Cry, uh, the words of her father after their house uh, was burned down. And even in that moment, I could see where some people might be upset about saying, you know, we're going to pray about this incident. But I can certainly see the value. I mean, that might even be said to be black self-respect that, hey, uh, none of us died. I have my family. I have uh, my wife. I have my children that is way more important than anything uh, in this house. And yes, that's a major act of terrorism, but man, uh, we're here, we're safe, you know, and it looks like that's what he did go about the work of, you know, putting back uh, what he could. Uh, I appreciate, I so appreciate uh, the word terrorist and terrorism being used consistently in the book. Supremely important to be accurate with our use of terms. Uh, so I'm so glad that that's the word that they're using in the text. Um, 
Felicia Rashad during narration for the book that kind of stood out to me as uh, we went along as they were given the introduction for the text. Uh, really appreciated them giving these specific uh, statistics for the thousands of lynchings and uh, just from the work uh, that has come out. Um, I forget the author's name, but they had a big report in 2015 uh, about the basically they have undercounted like they do with everything related to black people devaluing black life uh, that they minimized the number of black people who were victims of these uh, terrorist lynchings. So it's probably significantly more than the 3,400 uh, reported here. Um, uh, she says uh, one of the, the lynching victims was her great uncle who had been accused of dating a white woman, Cal Bell, although this crime was never proven proof was never Proof was unnecessary. All that was needed were innuendo, innuendo and rumor. Whispers were enough to spark mob rule, certainly as it relates to racism, white supremacy. Uh, she says, it seemed like my father was always being threatened, especially when he hauled his lumber to the train station. The whites who were angry because he was in competition with them would lie in wait, stop him on the road, pull out their guns and curse him. White Terrorism. I mean, can you imagine growing up in a child as a child in Alabama in the early 20th century, 1900s, where this is happening to your father on a daily basis? Talk about workplace racism. Can you imagine? That's why I, said I just had trauma. Like if I needed one word to sum up this whole chapter, this whole book, trauma, trauma. Um, but just experiencing that and again, just appreciating the details of that being clarified in the text. Um yeah, I thought that was a great point uh, that Roz brought out about uh, United Independent, uh, the other black people they ran. That is the result of terrorism. That is the result of trauma. That's reasonable. And I think I've heard Mr. Fuller say you do not hold a person being afraid. You do not hold that against them. Everybody uh, is human to be afraid of something. Um, let's see. Oh, my God. Yeah, the passage where she says uh, telling she overheard her father telling her mother, I don't know if I'll be back tonight. Trauma. I just keep. Are repeating it just to have this sort of thing be a normal way of life, uh, hearing this sort of thing and living under this constant direct threat of terror where not just, you know, somebody might say something bad like our whole family could be killed. We could lose everything. Our whole house could be burned down or anything could happen to us. Um, Bernie McMurray Scott, her talking about this reminds me a lot of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing as well. Uh, hearing more about the family that produced uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, where she's talking about her mom. She sounds like a very codified person who had a tremendously accurate understanding of racism, where she says, uh, talking about her mom, she says, uh, was more resentful of the racist people around us. You just can't trust whites. Her mom would say in later years, she did develop friends with whites, which was only natural since her mother, Molly McMurray, my grandmother was part Irish. My mother was fair skinned. There were a lot of interesting uses of the word fair uh, in the text, uh, which remind me of why Mr. Fuller suggests not using that term, particularly not using it to describe someone as being, quote unquote, fair skin. Uh, we don't want to suggest that people have skin that is more deserving of justice than people who are not fair skin, if that makes sense. Um, oh, yeah, I think I think it was pointed out. I think it was retired firefighter who said about the, the portion. I highlighted it because she said it twice. I heard Mr. Fuller say the exact same thing. And these people are all kind of in the same age range. Uh, Mr. Fuller, Dr. Welsing, Coretta Scott King. So it to me it is not surprising uh, hearing similar types of thinking, uh, similar bits of logic uh, that they have held on to as being important ways that you minimize uh, conflict. But I had such a big la seldom visits make a long friend. That sounds exactly like something I feel. And I've heard Mr. Fuller present almost the exact same type of scenario to get away from that, you know, just idle uh, chit chat and talking about nothing because that's exit seldom visits make long friends um, I thought it was interesting I think maybe I'll get into more things and then we'll see if other folks have commentary I thought it was uh, significant not just interesting significant when she says uh, she was talking about all the degradations and, and terrorism that, that they experienced she said I absorbed the derogatory examples I saw of how women and blacks were treated and it, I think we've had a lot of discussions about that right now uh, when people make statements like that. 
uh, certainly you have some black people are women, right? So, I mean, it's curious all the way around when I hear the phrase, I almost feel like people should just go ahead and say white women and blacks, which you just further, uh, I think, which would cause people to pause even more to think, is that an adequate comparison? Are we saying that white women and black people, males, females, children, elderly, are comparable in terms of how they were being con- uh, treated in anywhere in the world at any time? Is that what we're saying? I'm throwing that out rhetorically. Uh, last thing I will get in. Whoa, there were a number of them. Um, the cotton already said something about that. Um, wow. I took a lot of, no, I'm trying to pick out the best thing I'll, I'll get in for right now. The thing I'll get in for right now, the swimming pools that's popped up again. I think people remember this, the incident that happened at McKinney. Uh, I think a lot of their book, their whole books and, and fields of research on racism, white supremacy and access to swimming pools or beaches to have another example right here. And again, our book club, Richard Williams, for people who uh, remember the, the father of Venus and Serena Williams, had the same thing in his autobiography where black, in fact, uh, where he talked about black children dying uh, because they could not go swim at the public swimming pool. She has the exact same example here. Marion had a swimming pool, but blacks were not allowed to use it. I had, I tried to learn to swim in a pond instead and almost drowned. Trauma. Trauma. I will stop. Oh, and I never learned to swim. I've heard that a lot, too. There's whole bodies of research on that where you have black people and people have the tacky audacity to come out and say that black people don't swim because they don't want to get black or they don't want to get their hair wet. I've heard that as well. And they will conveniently omit white people have a long history of putting laws in place to restrict black people from being even able to use or have access to pools or places where they could learn to swim. Maybe that is a greater reason why you have lots of black people who don't swim, don't know how to swim, what have you. Even I think some of that came up this past summer when uh, the young black female, when she won a gold medal uh, in swimming uh, in the Olympics in Brazil. And some of this exact same dialogue came up then. I will hush. Uh, Other folks have commentary that they would like to get in. Anybody that we missed completely, if you have commentary, you should definitely get your hand up right now. Uh, And then if other people uh, just period have comments they would like to share, Feel free. Um, can I be heard if there is no one who hasn't been heard yet? Uh, let's see. Am I seeing other hands? Uh, I don't see other hands. I just see other callers, but they're spectating thus far. Okay. Um, is it okay if I, if I just get in a couple of the other things I wanted to discuss? Because you're right. I took notes like crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. Feel free. I, I, thank oh, you so much. Oh. Oh. <laughs> No, well, we won't make them wait because they waited too long. Go ahead, Roz. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'll try and be quick. Um, there's like three things. The, on page 18, uh, she writes, As a faithful teenager, it was hard for me to reconcile the lessons of Christian living. I learned in church, in, excuse me, with the way whites who also call themselves Christians behave towards us. Sometimes our father would take us to town on Saturdays where we were greeted by whites-only signs and made to go to the back door to get a sandwich. When we bought ice cream, we had to wait until all the whites had been served. No matter what flavor I asked for, the druggist would usually give me vanilla, served at the back door. Such treatment made me question whether my skin color was something I could rub off, since it seemed to be the cause of the problem. But church was an escape and a sanctuary from these daily degradations. It and, excuse me, and it sustained our faith that the Red Sea would be, would be parted and opportunities would await us on the other side. <clears throat> excuse me. And I just found this, this section uh, particularly telling uh, just because, uh, first of all, you go to the back door of a drugstore to get a sandwich, which is dangerous because you don't know what they're putting in your food or if they spit in it. But then beyond accepting the sandwich, when you ask the, the white druggist for ice cream and you tell them what fa- flavor you want, he's going to serve you white. I'm going to serve you white every time you come here. Vanilla. Just take it, nigger, and go away. So it's, it's a, it, to me, that's a form of psychological acculturation to loving things that are white or acculturate, being forced to acculturate yourself to white things, even in the form of ice cream, for crying out loud. And then 
I found it particularly telling when she discussed uh, potentially rubbing her skin, rubbing her skin color off, since it seemed to be the cause of the problem. And it reminds me of my sister-in-law, who, as a child, was called a nigger and um, told that she was dirty because of her melanated skin. And weirdly enough, she's a lighter-skinned uh, black female. And she actually tried one day to scrub her skin off, and she actually was in severe pain after ripping that uh, washcloth across her skin so violently um, because of what was said to her. So that just kind of took me to that memory of, of her discussing that and my wife discussing that with me. And then also when she discussed, um, she said, but church was an escape and sanctuary from these daily degradations, and it sustained our faith that the Red Sea would be parted and opportunities would await us on the other side. It reminds me of King Leopold's uh, letter to his missionaries, where he gives the true understanding of what Christianity was meant to do and the psychology of us being being uh, trained through religion to accept our abuse as some holy right and that on the other side, whatever that's supposed to mean, we're going to get whatever uh, rewards and bounty that the Christian Lord is going to bestow upon us. And again, this is no dig on her. She's a victim of white supremacy. And I was also a Christian as well. So I understand the psychology, though I haven't been one for decades. On the following page, she wrote, uh, there, were no do- there were no dormitories at Lincoln during the years that I attended, and to drive back and forth from Marion to Lincoln each day would have been too burdensome. So I had to stay with other families to be able to attend the school. That was fine with me. I was quite excited to enroll and felt nurtured and embraced in Lincoln's halls. Though when I tried to take a job doing housework for a white woman in Marion to supplement my parents' stipend, she expected me to be docile, to scrape and bow, and to use the back door. Her request made me feel unworthy. To consent to her demands would have meant that I agreed with her negative assessment of me. I was not then or ever the submissive, subservient type. That job didn't last. <clears throat> and that reminded me of my own mother. Um, when my mom came here in 71 from Trinidad and Tobago, um, one of the most, I call it the racist shock and awe campaign, one of the most shocking incidents she had was she worked as a home attendant for an elderly white racist who um, basically looked at her like she was feces under her shoes and pointed out her blackness and basically said she didn't want a nigger working for her. The woman was crippled in the bed with bed sores and nasty and ornery as can be. And my mother literally left her in the bed, called the um, the agency and told her, I'm leaving. Um, and they told her, well, you're not supposed to leave till another person gets here. She said, I don't care. I'm not working for someone who's going to abuse and mistreat me. I don't work for racists. And she walked out and the woman was screaming to the top of her lungs, come back, come back. You, you can't leave me alone in the bed. My mother looked at her like, which go drop that somewhere and get out my face. And I thought of that same thing when she discussed um, just not being submissive, subservient, and that the job didn't last. Just beautiful act of black self-respect. And lastly, on the following uh, paragraph, she writes, regardless of these challenges at Lincoln, I knew I was being shaped for my destiny. This shaping was not the work of human hands, but suggested a divine intervention. I had been plucked from the middle of nowhere, where I was surrounded by islands of hostility and placed in an environment of enlightenment. White teachers saw worth in me. In time, I saw the past excuse me, saw past the terrible symbols of burning crosses, hateful words, and malicious intent, and discovered that there were real loving people under a skin color that so often meant trouble or heartache for our community. My white teachers laughed, cried, went to church, and attended county fairs. Underneath the skin, the skin that had been so foreboding to me, were people with good hearts and fair minds. That word fair again, it was important for me to understand this. As a child who had been most had seen, excuse me, mostly the worst behavior of whites, it was critical for me to see a better side. And I feel now that these early contacts were divine connections. They reached me before the meanness that I had seen would create cement walls of enmity within my soul. I found this to be a very telling chapter. I mean, section. The reason why is because um, just the whole acculturation, again, like I said, of looking through, sifting through white people to find those good white people, then psychologically con- being conditioned to ascribe a level of humanity to them that doesn't exist and that they don't deserve. So that further re- breaks down your walls um, as far as just the way that you perceive them. Um, she also perceived them as church-going people, so there was a level of, I guess, commonality in that Christian experience that she saw as well. And um, I just found it really telling because it reminded me of um, the woman from from Britain whose son was murdered. And when her her grandchild found out what happened to her father, how she basically didn't like white people and the mother wanted her to actually not hate white people. I think you remember that person, Gus? 
Uh, Doreen Lawrence. Doreen Lawrence, thank you. Yes, it reminded me of that. And um, I just find that that, that cultural um, uh, uh, psychosocial conditioning to humanize people who don't function in that way, function as human beings, but function as savages, is just very telling about this, the, the psychology of how we're conditioned. And um, again, it's, it's no dig on her because sadly, my favorite teacher is actually a white teacher. And it tells me a lot. I didn't have that. The contact that I had with black teachers wasn't as uh, quote unquote productive for me. So my favorite teacher was my fourth and fifth grade white teacher, white female teacher who was the same teacher. And I thought to myself, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the ability, the power of white women being 70% of the, uh, the, the public school teaching faculty and how this creates this, uh, this godlike appearance of this white female who's standing in front of the class who's supposed to be a surrogate parent. Just uh, disgusting how we're, how we're conditioned. Thank you, and I'll meet my line. Hmm. Right on. Uh, just the scene that you mentioned that was really important where she was talking about thinking it was something wrong with her skin. It reminded me of President Barack Obama, uh, his autobiography, Dream from My Father. I think he has a very powerful passage early in the book where it's similar. He talks about, I think, seeing an article where a, a black male tried to peel his skin off. Uh, and he said that that moment stuck with him uh, as a poignant moment where he realized the magnitude of the problem of racism. I think, in fact, he said he felt like in that moment, he felt like he had been lied to, uh, that this was a bigger problem than he originally suspected. Uh, the other person dialed in uh, 9440. 9440, did you have commentary? Yes, I did. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, it's Colorado KC. Um, <clears throat> this first uh, chapter in the, in the beginning proved to be uh, very uh, affirming as to uh, my grandmother's stories as well as my uh, great aunt stories and uh, as well as some of the stories of my mother-in-law and uh, out of North Carolina. Just the, some of the similar instances, my, the parallels like um, her going to that school, uh, the same thing happened with my mother-in-law. She went to a school up north uh, just uh, to escape. Well, not to escape, but as an opportunity, seen as an opportunity. The stories of uh, seasonal, going to school seasonally. The, and then you, you know him by the time the harvest season happens, all the children uh, going out and supporting the family uh, and picking cotton and harvesting all type of other things and just, uh, just uh, really just kind of thinking appreciation. Uh, but also, it uh, really shows the the terrorism and uh, the economic conditions they were under uh, because the white society at that time didn't have, it was just something that, you know, you were looked at as that you had to do. You had to do for the family, purchasing the books, you know, the, the, the conditions of the school, you know. And uh, it just, uh, yeah, just seeing all the parallels. I'm sure they're not, they weren't the only ones, uh, even from uh, Ms. Corda Scott King's own account. Um, the other thing that I uh, also too noted, uh, like you said, with the her father immediately praying uh, after that terrorist attack basically happened, you know, I, I, I thought the same thing. I didn't really see weakness on that part. I don't even know what what you could do with two small, you know, two small girls looking at you and your wife and Tara and knowing what had happened to, you know, her great uncle and just just when was around them, period, you know, the threat of their life. Uh, I thought that was a great sign of black self-respect. And uh, it just, uh, I'm appreciation for People like her, uh, her father, and other men who, you know, they, they, those men did, a lot of those men did what they could do. You know, it seemed like to me in some, a lot of those situations, you know, as, as much as we, you know, I hear some people now, my peers say what they would do or what they want to do, you know, just to strengthen them, 
for the things that they could do, the things that they could control. You know, and I just uh just uh just really appreciate that. For sure, for sure. Uh if other folks have commentary you should uh in fact You'll have to wait till the second audio segment concludes. That way we'll have extra time. Uh, I did want to say quickly, we had a person, a uh, caller who wrote in, a uh, female caller uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, make sure I share her note. And then I just wanted to also get in. Uh, economics, I felt like there was some uh, great anecdotes on black entrepreneurship. Uh, she talked about the pride uh, in knowing that many of her family members are property owners uh, in Alabama. Uh, I think that's something folks talk about quite a bit uh, right now in terms of having black people uh, owning property uh, as best you can to do something constructive with it. Uh, I thought that was a great illustration, even you know her father and owning his own uh, business, uh, and particularly even her when she's going to school and talking about some of the difficulties that she had uh, working for this uh, white woman. Uh, lots of, of great illustrations of not just workplace racism, but black people trying to do things as best they could to be independent so they could not have to deal with white people directly and the land ownership piece. Call in Wisconsin. She wrote in and she said, uh, Mrs. King asks, why am I being treated differently? Why do whites hate us? She said she, when she was a child, she asked her mom this. Uh, her mother tells her to get an education, then she won't get kicked around. With all the education blacks have, it still has not stopped whites from terrorizing blacks. Absolutely. Uh, I was also going to say that to me does not answer the question. Uh, if someone asks, why am I being treated this way? Why am I being mistreated? And you say, get an education so that you can't be kicked around. Like, well, wait a minute. That, <laughs> I mean, that's all well and good, but that is not really an answer to the question. Just pointing that out. With that, we will get to the second audio segment. If you have uh, additional commentary that you didn't get to share, just make a note. Uh, we should have ample time once the second audio segment concludes. Uh, so we are picking up right at the very beginning, chapter two, context of white supremacy. This is the autobiography of the late Mrs. Coretta Scott King, my life, my love, my legacy, context of white supremacy, audio segment number two. Two, a sense of belonging. Before I went to college, I knew I would have to live and compete in a world with people different from myself. I wanted to be able to hold my own with people everywhere. To do this, I needed a broad-based liberal arts education. For me, Antioch was the answer. Founded in 1852, the college was a pioneer in multicultural living and education. It prided itself on being a laboratory for democracy. It was among the first non-sectarian educational institutions in the United States, among the first co-educational colleges in the nation to offer equivalent opportunities to both men and women, and among the first to appoint a woman to its faculty and its board of trustees. It was also among the first to offer African Americans equal educational opportunities. At Antioch, I expanded the worldview I had begun to develop at Lincoln. The school had a strong sense of community, a spirit of mutual admiration for others. There was a sense of belonging. And its emphasis on being your brother's keeper and giving service to humankind captivated me. My horizons expanded there as I met people of all different races, cultures, and religions. I had two white roommates which would have been unthinkable in the South. We got along and found it to be a good experience. With them and other close friends, I began building on the good experiences I had had with whites in Marion, and I remembered my father saying, even during the worst times, there are still some good white folks. First at Lincoln, now at Antioch, I was broadening my understanding of whites and coming to see them as people like anybody else, in need of the same basic principles, love, understanding, and respect. At Antioch, we were exposed to Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other different religions and cultures. Nurtured by this diverse, pro-peace environment, I began to dream of a world in which all kinds of people would be welcome and could live in peace and harmony. Years later, a label would be attached to this vision, the Beloved Community, where love and trust triumph over fear and hatred. 
The term is most often attributed to the American philosopher Josiah Royce. To me, the beloved community is a spiritual bond that claims the energies and commitment of a diverse group of people who desire to serve a cause larger than themselves. The beloved community is fueled by unconditional love, feels like family, and transcends race, religion, and class. At Antioch, long before I could explain it, I began to put flesh on the skeleton of my thinking about such an ideal, and the education I received and the connections I made prepared me more than anything else to be a part of one of the greatest human rights movements of the 20th century. This is not to say that there were not some bumps and bruises along the way, but the hard knocks prepare one for leadership as much as the soft landings. For one, I had to do a lot of remedial work because I had not had the proper preparation in elementary school to high school, and I had to learn how to concentrate. I didn't know how to study. As a freshman, I had to look up virtually every other word in my textbooks because my vocabulary was very limited. I hadn't been challenged enough. Now I struggled to catch up. It was very difficult, but in time I did catch up, and here I saw the vision of what I could become. I also came rather quickly to realize that the North was not some sort of racial utopia, and that there would still be prejudice and ignorance to face. I learned that Edith had left some of the negatives out of her letters to me, for fear that I wouldn't come to Antioch. I came to empathize with her as one of the only blacks— Any black who has been a pioneer, breaking the color line in any corporate, government, or educational position will know what I mean. Students and faculty considered Edith an expert in race relations. She was expected to know all about anything that happened to anyone anywhere in black America, and to have answers. Whites wouldn't want to have normal conversations with her. They just wanted to discuss the Negro problem morning, noon, and night. This became a burden. Also, while Edith was tall and attractive, with that striking Native American look from our mother's side of the family, none of the white guys had the courage to formally ask her out. While Edith's Antioch experience was far from perfect, it didn't sour her on higher education. She transferred from Antioch in her final year, graduated from Ohio State in 1949, received a master's in English from Columbia University and later an MFA in theater from Boston University. In 1954, she married Arthur Bagley, a graduate of Cheney University who received his doctorate in education from the University of Maryland. Years later, Edith joined the faculty of Cheney, where she founded the theater arts major. She retired in 1996 as associate professor of fine arts in the Department of English. Arthur was the chair of the Industrial Arts Department. When I arrived at Antioch, I saw some of the difficulties Edith had experienced. What irritated me especially was the ability of some whites to accept me only as long as they could separate me from my race. People would say ignorant things like, well, you're so different from the rest of them, as if they actually knew the 11 million rest of them. Often people asked me, Why aren't there more blacks at Antioch? The questioner's tone usually suggested it was our fault for not being there in larger numbers, giving no consideration to the economic barriers or institutional racism that had been blocking blacks from gaining a quality education since the days of slavery. I also faced a painful scenario when it came to my love life, when in my junior year I had my first experience with interracial dating, something that never could have happened back home in the South, where miscegenation was outlawed and punishable by imprisonment. Even in the North, the practice was ahead of its time. The Antioch student body was virtually all white. In my class, there were only a few black students, so there was an unspoken expectation that I would date a certain black guy. My Cupid friends had selected a nice young black man to be my date, but I resented their matchmaking. In retrospect, I see that it would have been nice at least to have gone out with him. He was Leon Higginbotham Jr., now deceased, who became one of the first blacks appointed to the federal bench. I chose, however, to date one of the Jewish guys, Walter Rybeck, a fourth-year student from Wheeling, West Virginia, and my piano accompanist. We dated for about two years, doing fun things together like bird-watching and attending folk festivals. 
We became rather serious about each other and discussed marriage, but I wanted a career, and he was concerned about the racial and religious identity of our children. Would they be half Jewish, half Christian, half black, half white? We were stymied at the thought of the many barriers we would have to cross. We soon had an experience that would answer our nagging questions about whether we could be happy together as an interracial couple. On Tuesday, November 9, 1948, I made my singing debut at Second Baptist Church in Springfield, Ohio, with Walter as my accompanist. The performance, publicized in several local papers such as the Xenia Gazette, was well attended with more than 100 people in the audience. Still beaming from our success after the concert, Walter and I attended a folk dancing festival in Wheeling, West Virginia. Walt got out of the car to place a phone call to his parents, asking them to meet us at a certain restaurant in town. When he got back in the car, I had one question. What about me? He paused, searching for words. It had not even dawned on him that I would not be allowed to eat at the restaurant he'd selected. When his parents arrived, we ate somewhere else, but the experience depressed me and marred the weekend. It gave us a powerful glimpse of what an interracial marriage would be like and the challenges we'd face if we stayed together. One of us would be welcome somewhere, the other would not be. One would be associated with what was right with the world, the other with what was wrong. All of it was too much baggage for us to carry, and so we broke up. Bruised from that heartbreak, I distracted myself with my studies, but racism also challenged me in my degree path. I was the first black person to major in elementary education at Antioch, with a minor in voice. In order to meet all the requirements of my major, however, I had to teach for a year in the Antioch Private Elementary School and for a year in the Yellow Springs, Ohio, public school system. Because there were no black teachers in the Yellow Springs public school system, I was deprived of my right to teach there. When I took my concern to the supervisor of student teaching, she did not support my right to teach in the local school system. This disappointed me deeply. Instead, she suggested I travel nine miles from Antioch to teach in a segregated school in Xenia, Ohio. Her rationale was that God did not intend the races to mix. When I took the issue to the president of Antioch, he didn't support me either. Later, I learned that he had a black dog named Nigger. In the end, I was given two options. Go to Xenia and teach in a segregated school system or teach another year at the Antioch school. I refused to go to Xenia. I'd left Alabama to be free of segregation. I appealed to the local school board, but that failed. I tried to rally the students to my cause, and after that failed, I appealed to Antioch College's administration, writing... My precious time and money have been spent for a commodity which I never received, only because my skin color happened to be darker. No matter how one might try to explain why the school board and the superintendent refused to let me teach in the Yellow Springs Public School, these explanations turn out to be none other than rationalizations, and the cold fact is that I was rejected because I happened to be the wrong color. This kind of injustice which I experienced is mild compared to what Negroes are facing all of the time in our society. Do you then wonder why America, as a leader among nations in the world, cannot command more respect among the common people who make up the majority of citizens of the world? Her inner corruption cannot long persist without backfiring. In the end, I had no choice but to do another year of practice teaching in the Antioch Private School to qualify for my Ohio teaching certificate. This incident left me terribly disappointed, but I refused to allow it to interfere with my determination to excel. The experience also fed my inward yearning to involve myself in something bigger. This was the first time I stood up publicly against discrimination, and I found that I rather liked making waves and being a catalyst for change. And the experience only deepened my resolve to continue the struggle blacks had always fought, which was for inclusion and respect. I knew that I would be black the rest of my life, so I could not back down or remain silent in the face of the injustice I would inevitably face. At the time, leaving my particular protest aside, Antioch bubbled with student activism, and I plunged right in, 
becoming active in the Antioch NAACP, a Race Relations Committee, and a Civil Liberties Committee, as well as with the Peace Movement, an organized group that aimed to bring about peace in the world. Having just lived through World War II, in which about 60 million lives were lost, peace activists wanted an end to wars. They refused to be drafted based on their conscience. Students like me formed a coalition around the peace activists to give them support and to send a message to the powers that be. I began to consider myself a pacifist. Pacifism felt right to me. It accorded with what I had been taught as a Christian, to love thy neighbor as thyself. I was also active in Henry Wallace's Progressive Party, which had a student chapter at Antioch, and two of my favorite professors, Walter Anderson and Dr. Oliver S. Loud, were officers in the Ohio branch. For a long time, I avoided talking about my Progressive Party affiliation. The party was often accused of having links to communism, and I did not want to besmirch my reputation. Later, with the battle J. Edgar Hoover was waging against my husband, I didn't want that past affiliation to become a noose around Martin's neck. But in 1948, I went to the party's national convention in Philadelphia as a student delegate. Its platform sought to end segregation, support voting rights for blacks, and provide national health insurance. That year, the Progressive Party won more than one million votes in the national election. Our local chapter convention was held in Columbus, Ohio. Paul Robeson, one of my greatest heroes, spoke, and Professor Anderson gave me the opportunity to appear on a program with him. Robeson had a lot in common with Martin. Widely remembered for his starring role in Eugene O'Neill's The Emperor Jones and his performance of Shakespeare's Othello, Paul was a hero to blacks because he stood up for their rights. The poor guy was harassed by the FBI, just like Martin, until his death in 1976. I was so impressed with him at our meeting and flattered that he liked my singing. Such a gifted man finding talent in me was great encouragement. After watching Robeson's performance, I tucked it away in my memory. It would provide inspiration years later. When I began giving my freedom concerts to raise funds for the movement, I patterned my concerts after his performances. He would give a political commentary before he sang, so that's what I did. I would talk about the struggle, the movement. I would narrate and sing, alternating parts of the story with a song. At Antioch, I also began to question organized religions and to experiment with kinds of worship that were different from what I had experienced at my little country church back home. I wondered if I would continue my religious expression through Methodism, A.M.E. Zion, Congregationalism, or Unitarianism, or even become a Quaker. I had come under the strong influence of the Quakers at both Lincoln and Antioch. Historically, they were zealous advocates for abolition, equal rights for women, and peace issues. I used to sit quietly in the chapel at Antioch and try to deepen my relationship with God in the Quaker way. The Quakers would sit and wait for hours for the Holy Spirit to move them. The process is like meditating and communing with the Spirit. Whoever is moved gets up and says what's in his or her heart. If you feel like singing, you sing. There is no choir, so if you feel like joining in, you do, but there is no formalized worship. The Quakers also believe in an uncluttered life and living simply, without a lot of materialism. This aligned with the philosophy my mother had passed on to me, which emphasized that material things were not important and that education was a prime value. She had urged us to get an education first. If we wanted clothes, cars, and other things, we would then be able to afford them. She used to say, clothes don't make you. It's the way you carry yourselves that makes you important. In this way, my experience with the Quaker influence at Antioch only deepened my family values. Finally, after six largely wonderful years, full of enlightenment and self-discovery, it was time for my chapter at Antioch to come to a close. But what would be next for me? Again, I relied on my faith to show me the path forward, and on what I've come to think of as guardian angels. Two beloved mentors, close friends and role models, 
my faculty counselors, Mrs. Jesse Treichler and Walter Anderson, helped me through Antioch and prepared me for the great leap forward, to follow my passion for classical music born in childhood and nurtured in college, and to pursue training at a music conservatory. Dr. Anderson, the college's sole African-American faculty member, headed the music department. He was remarkably gifted and could entertain the students by playing bebop or glide just as gracefully into a Mozart sonata. Through his counsel, I applied to five of the best music schools in the country, including Juilliard in New York City and the New England Conservatory in Boston. Although I was always interested in Juilliard, I received an early acceptance to the New England Conservatory and decided to go there. I thought it would be less expensive and stressful than New York City. So, in September 1951, it was time to put Antioch behind me and head to Blue Blood Country. There I would follow my passion to study music, and there a certain suitor would come calling, a call that would change the entire course of my life. 3. I Have Something to Offer 1951 was such an extraordinary year. I felt as if I had blasted through that moonlit sky in Heiberger and touched the hem of heaven. My life, one of picking cotton and milking cows in the deep south, was now consumed with singing classical music as a student at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. I was fulfilling my dream of becoming a concert singer. I imagined that one day I would study in Europe and debut at the Metropolitan Opera. These were the desires of my heart. They would only be a stepping stone, though, because I had never looked at my career as just being on stage. I wanted something more meaningful. I felt in my heart that I had to make a contribution to serve others through music, but also in other ways I had yet to discover. So it was with a great deal of promise and passion that I set off for the New England Conservatory. But it wasn't always, especially initially, an easy course. The main problem was that I had no money to continue my education. I agonized over asking my parents, but decided against it. I wanted them to enjoy the fruits of their labor instead of financing my dreams. Through my friend and advisor from Antioch, Jesse Treichler, I applied to more than a dozen places for scholarships. One, the Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, sent an encouraging reply that although its grants were already awarded for the current year, if someone dropped out or chose not to reapply, then the foundation would award me a scholarship. In retrospect, that promise was as thin as a tea leaf, but in my youthful zeal, I found it solid enough to take off for Boston. I arrived with fifteen dollars to my name, which I soon learned would not take me far. I had a place to stay and breakfast daily, thanks to Mrs. Treichler, who had written to a contributor to the Antioch Interracial Scholarship Fund asking for help. I stayed in a five-floor rooming house on Beacon Hill, a lily-white section of Boston. I was the only black student in my building. For seven dollars a week, I had a roof over my head, but I had to get a job to buy food and take care of the rest of my expenses. My money was running out too fast. What was I going to eat? The day before my money ran out completely, dinner consisted of peanut butter, crackers, and an apple. The next day, I only had 30 cents for a round-trip subway ride. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, help came from Mrs. Bertha Wormley, a person I had met only once through a mutual friend. During a phone call, she asked if I needed anything. Instead of answering immediately, I paused and cradled the phone, not wanting to lay myself bare and admit that I was broke. I was proud and embarrassed, but I could not hold back my feelings of desperation. I blurted out my troubles. To her ears, it must have sounded like torrents of pain, because she quickly arranged for me to meet her where she worked, at the Massachusetts State House around the corner from where I lived. When I arrived, she handed me a sealed envelope. After I left for school, I opened it on the subway. What joy! It contained fifteen dollars. It was such a help in my dire situation that tears coated my face. 
The kindness of this virtual stranger served to reinforce my belief that there is no situation in which we can find ourselves where God won't send help. Mrs. Wormley shared the spirit of many blacks of that day. She wanted to be a link in the chain that prepared the next generation. Where would we be without the Mrs. Wormleys of the world? In order to pay for my room and board, the landlord permitted me to clean three rooms on the fifth floor and to wash and iron the linens. I scrubbed the floors on my hands and knees. Because of my meager funds, however, I had to find other sources of income, which led me to part-time work with a mail-order company. It was hard work, but I was used to that. I had worked hard all my life. Now, with a goal clearly fixed in my mind, I sang as I scrubbed. I may have been on my knees, but in my spirit I was on stage, sending my arias leaping through the concert halls. At those moments, I never felt like a scrub woman. I felt more like a performer, playing a role that was ushering me into the fulfillment of a cherished dream. In my second semester, my financial lot improved, but for very ironic reasons. Thanks to the 1896 Supreme Court ruling of Plessy v. Ferguson, which made it illegal for blacks and whites to eat together in public, ride public transportation together, share water fountains, or, of course, go to the same schools, the state of Alabama, in order to maintain that ridiculous caste system, had to go through the motions of setting up separate but equal educational facilities. Alabama thus gave financial aid to black students who went out of state to get the professional graduate training only white colleges and universities provided. This aided the state's goal of keeping its schools segregated. Regardless of the motivations, I enjoyed spending Alabama's money after all the hard work my family had invested in Alabama soil. Overall, I was extremely happy. I was studying voice with Madame Marie Sundelius, a Golden Age Swedish-American metropolitan opera soprano. I was also making a contribution to improving society. In Yellow Springs, Ohio, I had challenged segregated teaching assignments. Now I saw myself adding color to the overwhelmingly white concert-performing arts scene. Eagerly, I looked ahead at the ground I could cover. I saw myself as a concert singer, paving the way for other blacks. As I looked at my new experiences, I felt something exciting stirring within me. It felt good trying to make a difference. I was gaining a sense of how to create a life of meaning. Granted, I had tasted only small slices of success in that area, but it was fulfilling to know that my appetite for creating change was not something nebulous or ethereal. Things really could change if you prayed about it, were determined, and worked to achieve your dreams. Although I had a gentle manner, I was beginning to suspect that I had a warrior's spirit. I was not the kind of person who was content leaving hurt or harm unchanged. I was settled into what I thought would be my life's work, thriving and happy, when one afternoon in my second semester at the conservatory— I got a call from my classmate, Mary Powell, a Spellman graduate. Coretta, she said, have you heard of Martin Luther King, Jr.? When I conceded that I hadn't, she went on to tell me about this impressive young man she had met. He was a promising minister, ordained in his father's church, Ebenezer Baptist in Atlanta, who was working on his Ph.D. at Boston University's School of Theology. She told me what a great orator he was, and how popular he was in Boston's black church circles. It was clear that Mary was playing matchmaker, but from what I was hearing, I was not that interested in a meeting. At the mention of his being a minister, a mental picture flashed through my mind. Someone narrow-minded, black-suited, and boring, whereas I wanted to meet someone who was exciting— I didn't want to be a minister's wife and subject my family to living in a parsonage. You know how everybody talks about the pastor's children. Besides, as a good Methodist, my style of worship was much quieter than that of the more emotional, shouting Baptists. I didn't know if I could make that great a leap of faith. Mary went on to tell me that Martin Luther King Jr. had confided in her that he was on the verge of becoming cynical. 
I have met quite a few girls here, he told Mary, but none that I am particularly fond of. Aren't there any nice, attractive young ladies that you might know? After Mary described me, his interest was piqued. He pressed her into giving him my number, which I believe she, happy to be a matchmaker, was secretly delighted to do. Soon after I spoke with Mary, Martin called and introduced himself. On the telephone, we chatted for several minutes, and then he said something I thought strange, considering the short time we had talked. You know, every Napoleon has his Waterloo. I'm like Napoleon. I'm at my Waterloo, and I'm on my knees. I'd like to meet you and talk some more. When can I see you? What do you mean? I asked. He said, well, any time you have. Perhaps lunch on Thursday, I said. That's fine. I'll come over and pick you up. I have a green 51 Chevy that usually takes 10 minutes to make the trip from Boston U to the conservatory, but I will do it in seven. With interest, but not any special anticipation, I waited for Martin outside the conservatory two days later, a cold January day. Under my tightly buttoned coat, I wore a light blue suit. When the green Chevy pulled to the curb, my first thoughts reaffirmed what I had anticipated. He was too short, and he didn't look that impressive. He looked like a boy, when I had expected a grown man. I later learned that he always wore a mustache which made him look older, but had shaved it off because he was pledging the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. We drove a few blocks to Sharaf's restaurant on Massachusetts Avenue. As we talked about our different schools over lunch, I felt his stare. He examined me carefully. His eyes moved across my face, lingering on my hair. I found him easy to talk to, and we chatted about everything, from questions of war and peace to racial and economic justice. Martin seemed impressed that I was knowledgeable about subjects other than my chosen field of study in music. In turn... I felt he was a man of substance, not like I had envisioned. In fact, the longer we talked, the taller he grew in stature, and the more mature he became in my eyes. As he was driving me home, we stopped at a light, and he turned to me. You know something? What? I asked. You have everything I have ever wanted in a wife. There are only four things, and you have them all. How can you say that? I replied in disbelief. I can tell, he said. The four things that I'm looking for are character, intelligence, personality, and beauty. And you have them all. When can I see you again? I was shocked into silence. What was I hearing? A man I had just met face to face a few hours ago seemed to be hinting at matrimony. I stared at him trying to determine if he was joking with me, if his expression would fade into a big smile and he would offer some kind of disclaimer. But he was intensely serious. Martin showed every sign of someone falling in love at first sight. I was certainly flattered by his attention, and he impressed me as a man on a mission, on an urgent assignment, who knew exactly what he wanted and wanted to rush on. But for me, it was an overload too much to handle at one time. Back in my room that night, sleep was impossible. I tossed and turned as I thought about Martin. I tested myself as if I were cramming for a final exam. What did I really feel about this man, Martin Luther King Jr.? My goal was clearly established. I had come to the conservatory to become a concert artist. Music was my first love, and I didn't want anything to get in the way. I didn't want to be in love, not now. Besides, I had thought myself in love before, and later found out I had made a mistake. Could I afford that same mistake again? But even though I felt as though venturing farther might put my career in jeopardy, my heart told me I clearly had to see Martin again. The next day he called, and I found I was excited at the sound of his voice. We chatted, and he asked me for a date on Saturday. I had a tentative date for that afternoon, but I told him I would let him know if that fell through. Sure enough, it did, so when Martin called me mid-afternoon on Saturday, 
I agreed that he could take me to a party. When we walked in the door, girls swooned over him, and he seemed to bask in their admiration. In a bit of self-flattery, he told me, You know, women are hero worshippers. Their fawning behavior over Martin, my date, certainly heightened my interest. For someone only five foot seven and twenty-two years old, his personality was such that all the girls seemed to look up to him. Here he was, one of the most eligible bachelors in Boston, and he had taken me to the party as his girlfriend. Virtually every woman in the place would have traded places with me gladly. But the question remained. Would I move out of the way and let them have him? Or would I take him as seriously as he was apparently taking me? Again that night after the party, he talked about marriage. And again, I tried to keep a level head. This time, when he took me home and walked me to the door, we embraced. And for the first time, I felt that here is a man I really could fall in love with, if I could just let myself. In our subsequent dates, Martin proved so much fun to be with. He was a great tease and a good dancer. He could do everything from the jitterbug to the waltz, though after he became a pastor, we had to give up dancing. He loved concert music, too, and early in our courtship, he took me to a concert by the great pianist Arthur Rubinstein at Boston's Symphony Hall. I was touched that Martin, who knew how much music meant to me, would think of such a perfect date. The more I was with Martin, the less I could find not to like about him. There was no question that he was compassionate, held deep moral convictions, and sincerely wanted to change the conditions of the less fortunate. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that these qualities were far more important to me than his age or height, and I chastised myself for initially making these quibbles so important in my assessment of him. It was clear that in some way he wanted to take the abstract, ethereal concepts floating in his head and apply them to concretely change the oppressive state of black America. In his discussions of Karl Marx, for example, he always analyzed Marx within the context of what was best for America's poor. He told me, Communism or capitalism? Each holds a partial answer, but neither the whole truth. I could never be a communist. My father is a capitalist, but I could not be that either. I think a society based on making all the money you can and ignoring people's needs is wrong. I don't want to have a lot of money and own a lot of things. As he continued to talk, he seemed to fit nicely into the political scene and sensibility I had embraced at Antioch, where we were all out to save the world. This is so wonderful, I thought, to meet a man who is really serious about changing society. Martin's love of Gandhi and his dedication to Jesus Christ captivated me, and I eagerly listened to his ideas about how to weave the views of both into a philosophy of nonviolence that would achieve social justice. Later on during the movement, Martin often told me that Christ furnished the motivation and inspiration, and Gandhi furnished the technique for social change. As he explained it, Gandhi was probably one of the first persons in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social and collective transformation. From my Sunday school studies and activist days at Antioch, I had developed core beliefs about the principles of Christ and Gandhi. I took very seriously the words, Thou shalt not kill, one of the Ten Commandments. I felt it was a sin to kill, and that war hardly ever justified it. When Martin and I were tossing around ideas, I saw that my views were more global and pacifist, while his were more focused on direct action to change the oppressive structures of black America. At that time, that difference seemed inconsequential, but one day it would mean that I would become an earlier critic of the Vietnam War than Martin, and would help persuade him to call for a halt to the bombing. I remember thinking how desperately black America needed a plan for social transformation, but we were only college kids tossing around ideas. Who would have thought that the ideas we discussed as young students 
would one day evolve into a systematic action plan that would change the circumstance and lives of black Americans, the South, the nation, and many parts of the world. What impressed me most about Martin was his integrity, and how he himself told me about the other woman, so to speak. He had been dating a young lady back in Atlanta rather seriously. My friend Mary Powell had already told me about her, but it was so comforting to hear Martin's confession from his own lips. His honesty was the quality that touched my heart most deeply. I felt he was trustworthy. From the very beginning of our relationship, he was the kind of man who could not keep a secret. If he did something wrong, no matter how big or small, he was so tortured by his conscience that he was miserable until he discussed it and asked forgiveness. He was constantly examining himself to see if there was any sin that had crept into his life. Was he being selfish? Was his commitment as total as it should be? Had he been insensitive? Had he overlooked someone who had done something nice? He was always looking for a sin to clean up, starting with sins in himself. Right on. So we will pick up there next week. Uh, we are, <clears throat> excuse me, still in chapter three. Chapter three. Uh, we're kind of in the midpoint. Uh, we'll pick up there for next Friday. Uh, folks would like to chime in, share their views. Uh, we should have ample time. Uh, the number again is 641-715-3640. The code is 564 Nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. All of the folks who dialed in with a hand up should be with us. I'm um, just double checking to see if there's anybody that we uh, missed completely. Oh, I think we got uh, Thomas in New York. We didn't hear from him first time around. You should be with us. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Good evening, Gus. Um, good evening to the call. Um, I did get a chance to hear the first audio in completion, then I had to get on the road, and I heard a little bit of the second. Um, very interesting. Um, I think that um, very, very interesting life. Uh, hearing the stories of her childhood was very uh, heartfelt. Um, however, she seems to be... Uh, even going through all of that, very forgiving of white people for what they've done. That's what I've gotten from it so far. Um, like I said, I only caught a very, very small fraction of the second audio. Um, and the part where she said she was more of an internationalist, it kind of, there was a movie that came out a while back. It was, um, it was a movie about her and Betty Shabazz and their relationship. And um, she she was the one who went to Malcolm and um, was trying to um, get on board with the more of the global, you know, human rights thing. And I think maybe that that kind of showed. But uh, other than that, um, I just think she's very apologetic to what was done to her. I mean, this is gruesome stuff. I, I, I could never forgive anyone. Um, let my guard down. I don't care how nice they were at a school or whatever. And I'll move my line. Thank you. Right on, right on. <clears throat> uh, other folks uh, who dialed in who have a hand up, uh, line should be open. Uh, feel free if you have commentary. Uh, greetings again. Uh, I'm kind of like taking a taking it slowly to collect my thoughts. Uh, Basically, my, my thoughts in the second reading um, was, which is not unusual, uh, because even though I'm younger, uh, some of the similarities affected me also. I, uh, I think, uh, from an honest standpoint, because of how dastardly complex the system of racism white supremacy is, uh, how terroristic it is, what also comes out of that, out of that on non-white people, it 
it makes them fascinated with white people. Uh, to whereas, it, and, 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 well, we all heard of Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, so you, so we individually have a, have that effect. A lot of us do. Some of us are willing to admit it. Some of us are not because it's actually, it's not ego boosting. Uh, but, uh, some of our, uh, uh, paths in life follow right in that line. And I think I noticed a little bit of it in Mrs. King, in, in the writings anyway, about her uh, from the standpoint of insisting upon uh, not teaching at, a, uh, at institutions where our children are at. Uh, I had experience where myself where... Uh, of course, during my childhood, being that I'm 59 years old, uh, my childhood up until I would say what is called middle school was called junior high back back in my day, that all of my teachers were non-white black except for one. And she was the only white person at this elementary school. And I had the unfortunate luck to uh, have this person as, as a teacher in fifth grade. But, uh, and most of those people, if not all, went to these historical, the historical black colleges. Uh, but uh, her uh, path took her differently. Uh, I just kind of chuckled from the standpoint of of her describing her husband uh, about how honest he is. Well. He probably had to do a whole lot of apologizing to her, <laughs> based on based on uh, his uh, uh, life uh, away from her. Uh, uh, VGQ, I put it that way. <laughs> if, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, some of us know what I'm talking about, uh, as far as that concerned, especially when she mentioned about the uh, the one uh, young lady. Uh, well, it was, uh, it, it, I guess in this book, uh, well, she's not, I, I don't think she would talk about it in, in, in her book, but, uh, uh, there is uh, a lot of, uh, situations where that probably had to be done a whole lot, but anyway, uh, yeah, uh, very interesting, very interesting read. Uh, uh, did she play a direct part in writing this book herself? Yes. Gus? Yes, she did. Okay, great, great, great. So we, we're get, we're getting we're getting a good story here. We're getting a good story here as far as what uh, she's putting down. And uh, yeah, uh, that's that's all I have to say right now. I, there's a lot more to think about, but it's so much. I just have to put it down on paper, and then I'll uh, get a chance to express it again if there's time. Thank you. Mm-hmm. This book, just like <clears throat> the autobiography of Malcolm X, the official title, As Told to Alex Haley, the official title of this book is As Told to Reverend Dr. Barbara Reynolds. So absolutely. And the only reason that the book took so long uh, to be published was I think there was uh, there was some sort of dispute uh, around her estate. And so that delayed the publication. But yes, this book uh, was finished before uh, her passing. Uh, and she did directly contribute to it. Other folks uh, have commentary? Yes, sir. Have you heard? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, I was just thinking, you, you, I'm a long time uh, uh, caller to the uh, program, and I was trying to think of the alumni that you mentioned that also went to Antioch. And I thought about uh, Cynthia McKinney, but I think she went to Antioch University. And I think um, Mrs. King, that was Antioch College. So I'm at a loss for who that alumni is. But um, some of the things that stood out to me was uh, Mrs. King's relationship with a white male, uh, I guess a Jewish man she had met when she was in college and uh, which we term tragic relationships. It seemed to have an effect upon uh, later on when she met Dr. 
King or Martin Luther King at that time. Uh, she seemed more reserved with him than she was with the, uh, the white Jewish male that she met. And I think that the book said, uh, I don't have the, the book yet, but I think she said that the Jewish guy had a dog, a black dog named Nigger. Uh, but, you know, um, I think she alluded to the fact she may have been even uh, in love with the guy. You know, but these tragic relationships, uh, long lasting effects on us and the influence of the uh, Christian belief that she got from Lincoln, uh, from that Lincoln school and later uh, from the Quakers had a, a big influence upon her life and the way that she uh, viewed things. Uh, she mentioned that uh, somewhere along the line that uh, they were asking her why didn't more blacks attend that uh, college and assuming that I guess she all blacks know each other and we see that today uh, just recently when uh, uh, the now acting uh, President Trump you know, uh, said that to a black female reporter, uh, asking her if she knew members of the black caucus, when she could set up a meeting with him, you know, assuming that she knew some of those, uh, people. And the last thing is, uh, I believe Mrs. Warmly was, uh, a black female. I'm not sure, but the lady who came up with $15 for her, when she was uh, uh, destitute and running out of money. Uh, and if she was black female, like I uh, assume, then that was uh, a show of uh, uh, black unity or black self-respect. Now I'll meet my line on that. Thanks. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to speak us. Um, I'll start on, uh, yeah, I took a ton of notes this time around too. Uh, this book is just uh, turning out to be a real treat. Um, just like I, I totally agree with Thomas in New York and on um, peace to you as well, that um, she has had a very, very interesting life to say the least. And this is only like the middle of the third chapter, possibly just unbelievable. Um, she says on uh, page 24, uh, this is not to say that there were not bumps and bruises along the way, but the hard knocks prepared one for leadership as much as the soft landings. For one, I had to do a lot of remedial work because I had not had the proper preparation in elementary school to high school, and I had to learn to concentrate. I did not, I didn't know how to study. As a freshman, I had to look up virtually every other word in my textbooks because my vocabulary was very limited. I hadn't been challenged enough. Now I struggled to catch up. It was difficult, but in time, I did catch up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here I saw the vision of what I could become. What I find very telling about that is um, she, at one point in the book, described uh, facilities as being separate but equal, a term that many of us are familiar with as far as just, you know, just regular history, hearing these things about uh, segregation and Jim Crow. And um, I just find that there was nothing equal about the education because she didn't get the proper education even when she had the opportunity to go to school. And um, when she talked about having to look up every other word in the dictionary, it made me think of uh, Minister Malcolm when he read the dictionary. Um, and I'm sure that that must have expanded her her uh, vocabulary quite exponentially. And what I've also found telling about that too was that she had to learn how to concentrate. And that took me back to what you said, Gus, about trauma. Um, I'm pretty sure it was quite hard uh, to concentrate or even figure out how to concentrate when you were constantly worried about the death of your father or some other relative. Um, so it was just very, very interesting. I found that chapter. Um, the next chapter, she writes, I also came rather quickly to realize that the North was not some sort of racial utopia and that there would still be prejudice and ignorance to face. I learned that Edith had, come, had left some of the negatives out of her letters to me for fear that I wouldn't come to Antioch. 
I came to empathize with her as one of the only blacks. Any black who has been a pioneer breaking the color line or in any corporate government or educational position will know what I mean. Students and faculty consider Edith an expert in race relations. She was expected to know all, all about anything. And uh, excuse me, that happened to anyone anywhere in black America and to have answers. Whites wouldn't want to have normal conversations with her. They just wanted to discuss the quote unquote Negro problem morning, noon and night. This became a burden. Also, while Edith was tall and attractive with that striking Native American look from our mother's side of the family, none of the white guys had the courage to formally ask her out. What I found telling about that is uh, just the fact that she, again, I think the uh, I think it was the firefighter, Mr. Demery, um, that discussed the fact that they thought black people everywhere just knew everybody. And what I found really telling was her discussion about white people that they did not want to have normal conversations with her. All they wanted to discuss was the Negro problem. So that sounds to me like what they would discuss in today's terms, what Dr. Wilson would say, what do, what do white people discuss um, when there are no black people and no non-white people around? They were doing it to her directly. And I just found that to be very interesting and uh, probably psychologically uh, ter terroristic just simply because I could imagine the types of uh, vitriol that she would receive in these discussions with these uh, terrorists. And um, when she wrote about uh, none of the white guys had the courage to formally ask her out, I'm thanking God for that. Like, the, uh, no voluntary rape, no no tragic arrangements there. Um, I thought that that was uh, actually a positive, not a negative. Um, also, oh, yes, uh, there was a paragraph on 25 where she, where she writes, um, when I arrived at Antioch, I saw some of the difficulties Edith had experienced. What irritated me especially was the ability of some whites to accept me only as long as they could separate me from my race. People would say ignorant things like, well, you're so different from the rest of them, as if they actually knew the 11 million rest of them, quote unquote. Often people ask me, why aren't there more blacks at Antioch? The questioner's tone usually suggested that it was our fault for not being there in large numbers, given no consideration to the economic barriers or institutional racism that have been blocking blacks from gaining a quality education since the days of slavery. And man, when she talks about separating uh, her from her race, that's something that I've experienced before um, in just many scenarios, um, and especially if people ever heard me like talking to my relatives or my parents, you know, switching to my Trinidadian accent, and we just get into conversations. And I've had that kind of thing, and it just irritates the, the, the living mess out of me. And I have to straighten people out about stuff like that. Of course, I'm gentle. Uh, with black people when this happened with them. But ultimately, um, when white people try to do that, I shut that down immediately. Um, also, when they talk about uh, you're so different from the rest of them, it's like everything they do is beyond just taking control and power. It's also about keeping us apart. And if we really pay attention to the levels that they go to to keep us in enmity with one another, we would really start to understand United Independent for what it really means, which is basically VGQ, but we all, all are working towards the same goal in our own way by making individual shifts in our behavior based on the shifts in our consciousness and understanding about the reality that we live in. And if we can start to really see that, because that's a linchpin in us making strides in, in this situation as well, is us just understanding that there's a reason they're trying to separate us on the level that they are. I'll stop there, give someone else a chance to speak, but hopefully I'll get a chance to um, chime in with a little more later. Thank you, and I'll meet my line. Right on. Uh, the caller at six nine hundred last four digits six nine zero zero. Did you have commentary? Yes. Uh, good evening, Gus. Uh, good evening to the callers and uh, the listeners. Uh, this is Jay from New York. Um, just caught in uh, the second um, audio clip, and um, some of the things that stood out to me, and interestingly enough, and I think uh, Mr. Demery Ford mentioned it. Um, the part about the black dog being named nigger, and I don't know if it's me or maybe some of the readings that I've kind of read over the last two years, but it seemed like in the early 19th century, like every racist had a black dog named nigger. So it would be, um, it was just interesting to me to hear that again. I think that's like the 10th time that I've heard that same scenario, um, but it was just interesting kind of a point um, kind of going back to that. One of the other things that I think um, if 
firefighter may have mentioned it, the fascination um, with kind of just the the, the white culture. Um, and I saw that in, in the reading there, how she mentioned while, while she was away, kind of just adopting to all of the cultures that were around her that were uh, the white culture so quickly. Um, so it was kind of like, and I feel that it kind of happens now when individuals go away to college, whatever groups they kind of get involved with, it's it's this kind of quick adaptation um, to anything different than what, where they came from. Um, and I saw that really pointedly um, in her reading, kind of how quickly she was taking to that, especially with the trauma that she went to at the hands of these individuals, but she quickly adopted into it. So I'm still kind of trying to wrap my head around that because I'm even thinking of the situation, I think it was with her uncle that had been lynched. I think the book said that he had been lynched, and, and, and I hope I'm correct, um, just with the rumor of his wanting to get into a tragic relationship with a, uh, with a white woman and um, how quickly her, I guess, fascination and her excitement was to be in that type of situation with someone. I'm just trying to kind of put myself back in that time and the trauma that was kind of uh, pushed through in the, in, the first, in the first section and then quickly just make that transition of being kind of excited about it. And, and again, you know, VGQ and it, it's just kind of, um, I'm just trying to put myself there and it's, it's just difficult trying to get there. But um, I guess it's, it's kind of like the fascination because as Firefighter mentioned during that time period, um, Again, like I said, I'm just trying to put myself there. So th those are the parts that kind of stood out to me um, in the reading thus far, but, uh, but interesting read thus far. Mm -hmm. I'll say uh, it's been a fantastic read. I really enjoyed the first uh, few chapters uh, that we covered this week. Uh, we'll be looking forward to reading more. And uh, if it's going to be this much detail and offering insight on her thoughts and experiences, like, wow, uh, I'm extra extra excited uh, i don't know if this you know could shake up my top 10 but two thumbs up for what we've read thus far the antioch college alumnus that i think everyone here should be very familiar with is the late dr francis cress welsing uh, she also went to antioch college and talked about on this program the fact that coretta scott king attended antioch just uh, a little bit ahead of her, uh, Coretta Scott King is a few years older than Dr. Welsing, and Dr. Welsing specifically mentioned at her time at Antioch that the president of Antioch College had a black dog named Nigger. She talked about that on the context of white supremacy. Both of those, in fact, Coretta Scott King and the dog named Nigger, and uh, the film Damn Busters. Uh, it's about World War II. It's a uh, it's an English film uh, about them going to blow up one of these really important German uh, dams to help them win the war against Hitler and what have you. And they have a black dog named Nigger. In fact, if anyone who listens to the compensatory call in, a lot of times they'll edit out when they say Nigger now in news clips and what have you. And I'll put it back in. It's from the, and this film came out in like the 50s. It's a black and white World War II film, one of the like Mr. Fuller classics. Uh, but uh, it's, what, there you go. It's when they call the doll, like, hey, nigger. And it, like, it's real, con like, it's done, in my view, it's done in such a conspicuous manner. And of course, nigger gets ran over by a car at the end. And the code for the bomb that they have to uh, detonate, blow up. Uh, and the big climax of the, the code name for the bomb is, you know, already. Now, uh, back to the text. Um, first thing, uh, I thought of Thomas in New York. Uh, he said, I don't know if he got to hear this part, but she said, uh, my horizons expanded. When she talks about her, her college experience at Lincoln, my horizons expanded there as I met people of all different races, cultures, and religions. I had two white roommates. I thought that should have been like the way it sounded. It should have been the end of the sentence uh, because in the book it's a comma, but that should have been like an exclamation point. Like, I had two white roommates. Can you believe it? Like, that's the way it sounded to me just white validation. Like, that is that is what we have been 
programmed, uh, brain trashed to think of as justice. That is what should replace racism, having two white roommates, or having friends with a white person, or having sexual intercourse with a white person. That is what we have been trained to think of as better than racism, when nothing could be further from the truth. Um, she goes on to talk about and all of the trauma, all of the terrorism that she and her entire family have experienced. She says that I remember my father saying, even during the worst times, there are still still good white folks. That, in my view, tells me a lot about how effective the system of white supremacy is. That you can, that even at that time period, where you have black people, where their family, relatives have been, we're not talking about lynching in an abstract sense, sense and looking at moldy photographs from, you know, 50 years ago, what have you. My grandfather was lynched. People in our family that we know were lynched, killed murder these things happened to us our house was bombed we're not talking about something that happened a hundred years ago our family barely lived through this and yet it's still there are some good white folks that to me tells me wow white people have done a phenomenal job in conditioning us and the power of finding that one two mystical good white person um let's see this was fascinating. I had no idea that Coretta Scott King uh, involved in some sort of tragic arrangement with a white person, although I'm not surprised. Again, this is what we have been conditioned to think of as justice, what we uh, should strive for, should, what we should uh, desire. Um, she says uh, she was concerned or excuse me, he was concerned about the racial and religious identity of our children. Would they be half Jewish, half Christian, half black, half white? We were stymied at the thought of the many barriers we would have to cross. Tragic arrangements. I thought it was also interesting when she talks about this whole exchange. She says uh, the difficulties, I guess, where they went to West Virginia. He picked a restaurant where she couldn't eat at. And then she says that. Um, this, this showed how difficult it would be if they got married, her and this white guy. Uh, and she says, uh, one of us would be welcome somewhere. The other would not be. One would be associated with what was right with the world. The other with the other with what was wrong. All of it was too much baggage for us to carry. So we broke up even in that right there. I feel like it's, or it's not, I feel the evidence. This is not accurate black people didn't have signs up saying you know no crackers allowed <laughs> you white folks aren't on what get on out of here you know we'll beat you out of town uh, if you come here if you the sun comes down on you in this part of town boy we you're gonna that's not what this is that racism gets presented in that man on a regular basis uh and that is totally uh incorrect to make it seem like yeah you know I, one week we go to a restaurant and i'm not allowed the next week we go somewhere and he's not a, no that's not that is not the system of racism white supremacy um Let's see. Next. Oh, man. This, I think, happens a lot where people do not talk about racism. Uh, where she says uh, her sister, where she was ahead of her at Antioch and left out some of the ugly bits of racism uh, that she was going to have to uh, deal with. And then she talks about not being allowed to teach in the public school system in Ohio and then uh, this white woman who, you know, I guess was supposed to be her counselor, whatever, at Antioch, uh, not supporting her to be allowed to teach at the public school. She says this disappointed me deeply. Instead, uh, this white woman suggested I travel nine miles from Antioch to teach in a segregated school in Xenia, Ohio. Her rationale was that God did not intend the racist to mix religion of white supremacy. When I took the issue to the president of Antioch, he didn't support me either. And then again, as Dr. Welsing said, the dog named nigger just. Uh, in my view, I think you are going to continually be disappointed when you have this new horizon or way of thinking that there are good white people or white people can be redeemed. You are consistently going to be disappointed when you get this sort of behavior from the quote unquote good whites. Um, let's see, I did take a lot of notes to see if I could get in maybe two more points uh, before we wrap. I thought it was really important, her uh, commentary on Paul Robeson. We talked about him on the program before, I think most recently when we talked with John Potash uh, in his book, uh, Drugs as a Weapon Against Us. And he talked about how 
as she mentioned, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI uh, purposely uh, attacked him to neutralize his counter-racist activity, uh, activities. John Patash says that he was the victim uh, of mind-altering uh, drugs uh, to silence him that had a devastating lifelong impact on his health and well-being. Uh, he talked about that on the program, thinking uh, that he was probably given a hit of uh, acid or some mind-altering uh, drug drugs as a weapon against us. The book, again, you can check it out. Uh, but I thought that was really important. Um, I thought it was also super important as well where she says, uh, uh, where she talks about some of the mistreatment that she experienced and not being allowed uh, to teach and what have you. She said, uh, the experience only deepened my resolve to continue the struggle blacks had always fought, which was for inclusion and respect. I knew that I would be black the rest of my life, so I could not back down or remain silent in the face of the injustice I would inevitably face. Very well written, right to the point. I guess the only thing I would say, it's, it's not that I'm going to be black for the rest of my life. It's that racist man, racist woman, racist child, they will be terrorizing me for the rest of my life. So I might as well get ready to deal with this conflict. Uh, last thing, do I, anything else I need to get in or if I can leave there? Um, I will rest there because I think there are going to be lots of lots of things to point out on this book uh, as we roll along. Super long. I'm super glad that I picked this book. I don't know if you'll have an easy time getting this book or not. It is new. Uh, I get the sense that this would be the sort of text that will probably be at the public library. This is not some sort of uh, incendiary item uh, like Mr. Fuller's code book or what have you. So I suspect you could probably get it pretty easily at the public library. The only thought I may have is that this is new. Uh, it might might be popular. I don't know how in demand it'll be, but uh, check your library, what have you. Let me know if you have difficulties uh, getting your hands uh, on a copy. But I'm very excited, and thanks again to the uh, New Orleans Tribune. Outstanding review of the book. I have it linked at Black Talk Radio Network, so people can uh, check it out. But uh, if the rest of the book continues in this manner, might have to reconsider my top ten. We will be here tomorrow. Compensatory call in 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Pacific. We will review. Lots of things went down over the past seven days. We'll catch up, share views tomorrow evening. Uh, just drop us an email if you have any confusion, can't find something in the archives, or have question commentary about the first like, segment of the uh, new book we started today, Until Justice at gmail.com. Thanks to everyone for uh, tuning in this evening. I hope it was a constructive investment of your Friday evening. Uh, again, I know it is springtime now, getting warmer. Uh, folks want to be outside enjoying the warm weather. Great. You still want to be codified. I would suggest sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. Uh, racists, they are going to war against us. We want to be in our correct thinking minds so we can use our brain computer as Dr. Welsing would say uh, we can use our brain computer to the best of our ability uh, to come up with solutions to solve this problem and to keep ourselves safe you never know when you'll be confronted by a race soldier badge or no and have to come up with on the spot thinking to save your life or anybody that you might be responsible for sobriety would be best that said creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Context of white supremacy signing out. Thanks all for tuning in and thanks to the pretty lady in Virginia for making sure Gus did not embarrass himself with the microphone unmuted. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. <laughs> I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>